Okay, uh, welcome back. Let's uh, get going again. Uh, I've just had a reminder that um, uh, this morning there were, there were some instances where people weren't using the mics and uh, whilst we can probably hear in this room it's creating uh, issues on, on the live cast because pe people who, who are listening, re watching remotely, they're, they're unable to hear. So anyone that's speaking, uh, uh, just make sure you've got the, uh, the mic with you. Um, I think um, as we drew to the close just before the lunch break, um, I was sort of setting the scene for us to talk about uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Lacolette issue. Um, and I know that Mr Jones is going to give us some information on that. But just for the break, uh, uh, or just as we broke, Mr Reid uh, mentioned to me that he wants to make sure that we don't miss... Uh, I think it's essentially issues about on-site recycling and processing, isn't it? Uh, is that correct, Mr. Rigg? Do you want to just set out? Yeah, it was just a brief assumption when we were talking about the sort of um, recycling methods and streams of stabilisation um, or any waste and risings. Um, it needs to be considered that sort of historically, the it's always been seen as a an available space to undertake that because of its current construction of the engineered cells and the fact that we have a, a waste management license uh, for the site. But um, it's to bring to the people's attention that the collet won't always be available. Um, space is rapidly decreasing and therefore there may be a scenario whereby those sorts of activities need to happen within the envelope of the, um, the applicants um, proposed development areas. And, and those sorts of, um, can, those sorts can, of operations. Can you just run through what, what sort of processes we're talking about here? Um, things like the um, reclamation of the oversized material, um, that will obviously require uh, mechanised sorting and grading machines, and potentially if crushing's to be done on site for reuse, um, those materials being brought up in excavations, uh, hardcore will be effectively combined with those sorts of materials. So that um, segregation process comes with its own risks of uh, materials release um, and the processing on site. Obviously, there's mitigations that can be taken to ensure releases are kept to a minimum. Um, but it's certainly one of our concerns, and we raised in discussion with the applicant, that um, although Collette will try its best and, and the Solid Waste Department will try its best to work with anyone that produces waste to try and minimise and reduce that waste going to disposal, the the fact that La Collette is becoming full, space is becoming very limited, the ability to rely on La Collette as a site to effectively decant waste to for processing and then reuse is becoming more limited as the time goes on. Okay, but those processes that you mentioned happening on site and I think we heard from Mr Slater saying some might be on site some some might be off site and I think I mentioned that obviously as you get to the later phases of development you're going to have a load of residents there who probably won't be best pleased if there's concrete crushing going on whilst they're having their cornflakes in the morning. There, um, there is that and there's also the the potential for sort of cross-contamination of different areas. So it's something we've discussed with the applicant as well as that any sort of operation that is processing those contaminated waste arisings will need to consider where they're being processed. They need to protect the, the ground in that area um, as a sort of receptor. Yes, and I think some of the issues I was picking up from Mr McCarthy uh, was around, oh, as, as you disturb this stuff and you start processing it, whatever you potentially release contaminants, whether it's asbestos or, or, or whatever. So I understand the issue. Um, where does that take me to, to my thinking next? So, I think the material consideration needs to be made that although it would be idealistic for that um, process to potentially be done in, a, in an existing waste management site um, that has these controls, has that um, protection of the environment built in, um, it's got to be realised that potentially within the envelope of this development, there will have to be a site or potentially multiple sites that replicate um, that protection to ensure <coughs> that these materials can actually be uh, reclaimed and reused safely. Well, 
one of the major issues we've seen, certainly with stabilisation, is depending on the stabilisation method or even the treatment method, some of those can take longer than expected. Um, and it's it's an issue we've come across on, on many sites as developments progress. Those sites uh, designed for those sorts of remediation practices suddenly become required for the development and either wastes have to be moved, decanted, um, or inevitably lots of people come to La Colette seeking an alternate location for their wastes um, whilst they're still undergoing treatment. And it's just to bring to your, to your attention that space at La Colette is a premium and is diminishing. Okay. Well, I think that it... This may be an issue that we're going to come back to later, isn't it? Because uh, it's going to be all about capacity and where, where this uh, waste is is dealt with. Um, are, are you saying that, um, I suppose from a developer's perspective, the idea would be you ship it off-site, it's dealt with in a specialised facility, and then you re-import the, what you need, uh, and uh, it's all clean and tidy, and it's away from uh, sensitive receptors? Yeah, that, that's a typical method of sort of mitigating the... But the real world kicks in, and that's yeah. unlikely to be uh, fully the case. It's unlikely to be an option, yes. And the process is down at the Collette. Certainly, the aggregates recycler that we have isn't set up for processing contaminated waste to recover um, what would be inert, usable materials that could be reprocessed. That would still require some conversion at La Colette, if La Colette was to be used, if it was available, to allow that placement of those materials for segregation. Okay, right. Um, you're you're going to stay on topic, please. The processing is interesting because it's like asbestos. You need to take it to a very high temperature. Um, so, and what we've got is a mixed waste. So, I, is there examples, are there case studies where you have such a mixture of toxic waste, which does include car batteries, uh, acids, and uh, asbestos, and organic waste, and other things in there that mustn't be heated up, like electrical cables, fire? Uh, protection that produces another waste. So um, it's not as simple on like, you know, dealing with asbestos on its own. It's highly, is there an, a case example anywhere in the world that you could point to that has successfully treated this waste to, of this mixture and um, made it inert? Um, I think if I understand what you're asking, a sort of very comprehensive mixture as potentially could be expected from the site, we're not personally aware of those sorts of materials being segregated to such a degree that you would be able to classify each individual section of waste and deal with it separately. Um, in most situations, the waste would be segregated as best as possible and the contaminated percentage would still be considered for disposal within engineered cells. Um, in the United Kingdom, there are dedicated landfill sites for non-hazardous and hazardous materials where they segregate them out and each of those different sites has a differing reuse after its completion and uh, closure that is related to the materials that are in place there. Typically hazardous sites become green areas and stay green areas. Non-hazardous sites can be utilised for um, human occupation but potentially with um, a uh, clarification not to be digging or interfering with the encapsulated waste below um, and there's different scenarios so there would be I'm not personally aware of times where complete mixed wastes that are excavated from previous landfills have been segregated to allow complete um, recycling of all materials So let's just ask Mr. Slater, um, what you were saying this morning was that um, uh, there could be processing on site and there could be some uh, export and re-importation or, or whatever. Um, is the applicants thinking any more detail than that or, or is, is that 
matter downstream will all to be worked out when you've done the further testing and you're looking at a particular phase. Um, I mean, have you looked at if you were to have on-site recycling uh, facilities where they would be best located? In terms of the next stage, what we propose is that would be actual trials. So we, Kelp Ray, who are the specialist contractor we're talking to, we could take a sample of a tonne of material back to the UK and actually do trials and look at how effective you know, different methods could be. Um, so that would be something that would fall out of the reserve matters applications. So that we, and it may vary between different phases, but that's certainly something that we would look to do, which would then be a, enable us to work out what were the right processes. Yeah, you know, we, we have an idea of what the right processes are, but you can undertake the trials and see how effective things are. You can add different mixes of cement to stabilise materials and work out which is the right amount of cement or type of cement to add. Um, so in terms of that, then that would be another part of the reserve matters stage. But in principle, you know, we can see that there are ways you can do this but we would look at doing those trials to reinforce what is the right method. And in terms of specific locations and logistics, we haven't looked at that in detail, but we have, you know, we talked with um, Mr. Reeve uh, and with Mr. Henry about, you know, possibilities of either on-site or an off-site location where we could process things that wasn't lacolette. So there are options available. And obviously, we would have to have all the right pollution controls in place to prevent dust, noise becoming an issue for people. But yeah, in terms of if it was on the development site, there is a construction environmental management plan, you know, an outline one included in the environmental <coughs> impact statement. And we would produce a detailed one once we know exactly what we're going to do. Understand. Yeah. I mean, it raises, thank you for that, but it raises a couple of questions for me. I mean, that sounds understandable, but um, can that be done under the current regime we're working with, where transboundary shipment of waste um, rules only allow us to ship for um, recycling, um, not for disposal, when we've got mixed waste, but we don't know whether it's toxic or not. And, of course, if we are going to have um, off-site... Uh, processing of waste um, because La Colette, which is the uh, already approved waste site, is full. Does that mean there need to be licensed um, waste management sites either on other sites to do this pro work or um, does it mean that there might need to be an application for a waste processing site within the development area on, on the waterfront if it's proposed to do it at the site? I think I would like value clarification of those. Two answers. Could I chip in, sir? Of course. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether your <clears throat> uh, discussion points, Carl, were relating to the export of waste at all. No. I thought it was more yeah, this was, options sorry, to for on island, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I think we've probably got a bit on, I, I certainly got a bit in my proof about waste export and options and what le legally is possible. But putting that to one side, um, Mr Young, your questions about whether or not well, what the regime would be that controls what the options are for dealing with waste on the development site or somewhere else. La Colette has a waste management licence. So if things are going to be exported to AAL recycling site or the government site at La Colette, there's a, there's a licence there and there's some options for what happens. There might be need some tweaks to, to the licence in terms of remediation options, but that, that's a possibility. You asked the question earlier about um, crushing plant and whether that needed a waste management licence. Not to go into too much detail, but I've just clarified a bit from what the, what the law says. Um, if you store more than 5,000 tonnes of material before you crush it, then you, you need a waste management licence. That's why most mobile crushing plant that goes somewhere 
to deal with some stuff it can crush off a demolished building, doesn't need a waste management license, it just happens. You probably need some kind of planning permission to do it there, perhaps, don't know, that's over to the planners. Um, so if this development proposal decides to crush something, um, it might be doing some excavations in a basement area and decide, you know, treating the waste it's excavating to an extent to separate the stuff it needs to crush from the stuff it doesn't. I wouldn't be seeking to license that operation as a waste management license site per se, because the whole proposal should, if it gets approved, we'll have a planning permit, we'll have conditions on and a SEMP, like you've mentioned, construction environment de demolition plan. So we're not just putting layers of waste management licensing law on top of things where, you know, it's about achieving objectives, uh, not about just layering laws on top of each other. So in general terms, a crushing plant wouldn't need a waste management license at the development site. But if you started doing clever things with soil stabilization and cementation, and it was at a permanent site on the development site, and it was gonna be there for 10 years, you know, it, it, the devil's in the detail because I've gotta make a decision about whether I think something needs to be licensed under waste management law because of its potential impact and what other laws in terms of planning permit and conditions is capable of controlling it. Yeah. So if there's some crushing plant that's on site for the development of one phase of it and it's gonna be there for a short space of time, um, I think the, the, the regulatory controls would be through the planning permit, whatever conditions were enforced and ultimately nuisance law if it was causing a problem. Depends what the emissions were, you know, noise, dust. Um, so hopefully there's some helpful comments to set the scene. Yeah, so I think what, yeah. I'm, what I'm hearing you say that the, the process is associated with construction uh, of the development and not necessarily gonna come under waste management licenses. No, otherwise we'd have to give every development site and construction site yes, because a waste management license. Well, use and a simple an analogy, if, 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 you, if you knock a, you've got consent and you, you knock a house, if you've got planning consent, you knock a house down and you sort the r pile of rubble into uh, slates, bricks, timber or whatever, you're, you are actually waste processing, aren't you? You're, you're actually Treating separating waste, out yeah. the, uh, but that wouldn't come under the-, the, the No, you know, I'd have to license everything. Yeah. We license things that are big and risky and can have an impact on the environment, like the reclamation site, La Colette, the incinerator, scrap yards. That's the principal focus of that law. Those, um, um, oh, sorry. No, sorry, Chris. Go sorry, on. Dave, yeah. So I was going to say that those types of processes would require the benefit of fresh application, planning applications anyway, either on site or even uh, La Colette, for example, as well. Um, uh, you know, so we would consider those on their own, you know, particular merits yeah. then. Okay. Mr McCarthy. Um, do, you, do you work for the Department of, um, the, of Infrastructure? Work for Infrastructure and Environment in the regulation side of the business, doing the pollution control work, yeah. Yeah, so you're responsible, <coughs> so the Department of Infrastructure is responsible for operating La Colette Waste. That's yeah, but I don't work for them. No, 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 but I'm, the <coughs> Department of Infrastructure does. Andrew does. Yeah. But we work in the same department yeah. since government reorganisation, yeah. yeah. So, so what I'm trying to get across is, 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 is the clarity of the information. Because you stated that La Colette has a licence to dump hazardous waste. I'm not sure whether I said those exact it, words, it didn't but say that it, ha it, it has got a. It's you got, said you could take it to there. It's got a number of waste management licences. Yeah, down no, I, I read them. Yeah. But it does not have any licence at all to transport any waste from this site to La Colette. The licence is for what happens at La Colette. It's not for bringing something from somewhere to La Colette. Yeah, yeah. No point taking. If I, this I'm trying to get across, if I excavated material on this site, I am not allowed, which is, which is hazardous waste, which we've heard about, today I'm not allowed to take it to your site at La Colette because you don't have a licence to accept it. 
There's two. No, Lacolette's got a license to accept certain types hazardous of waste. Hazardous waste. Yeah, I understand. In, the including hazardous waste. waste, yeah. No, no, because there is a list, isn't there, which you don't need to put on the screen unless we need to. There is a li list of all the licenses that exist today. And La Colette does have a license for scrap metal, recycling concrete, uh, you know, twigs, and obviously the domestic waste recycling area. So it does list them all. It does not have, and there is, sorry, also for the incinerator, the, there was a, a license for it building an incinerator, but the waste from the incinerator is exported for treatment. So let's not mix that one up. But it does not have today any license uh, that you can actually receive any hazardous waste. And the second thing I'd like to point out, for that to happen, you first of all have to have planning consent under Jersey law. Okay. I, I know where you, and, I know where you and, go, but, with but, this. But, but, Mr McCarthy. I, 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 I'm not, <laughs> no, no, no. Let, no you, please listen to me. Um, I want to explore La Colette in some detail, but I do want to do it in a structured order. My, my, my brain is not as clever as yours, Mr McCarthy. I, w I work in a fairly logical, linear sense. Um, and I'm going to ask lots of questions about La Colette, and, uh, including around site waste uh, management licences. But I want, I want to just get there uh, a, a step at a time. The, where we started with this discussion was Mr Reeves' concern that he records about uh, the on-site processing of, of waste and I think we've explored that as far as we can in, in the sense now quite where uh, material that is not processed on site goes that's for the discussion that we're, we're, we're going to move into but I think I've understood where the where the applicant is is on that you'll have plenty of opportunity very soon to uh, ask some questions about La, La Colette so I, I, I'm at the Main part is you comfortable that I move on to La Colette because I, I do want to understand. Um, I think two broad things about the site is firstly an overview of what it is, what it does, and that will possibly answer Mr. McCarthy's question. And then I want to quickly move on to uh, Mr. Jones, and he is going to give me a factual update on the planning application which has caused quite a bit of uh, interest and in media coverage um, and I, I really do need to understand that but I do stress what I said I think at the beginning of the day um, this is fact finding for me I'm not standing in judgment on that planning application I just want to understand the uh, the actual facts so if we can move on then to my item which is titled La Colette capacity and ability to receive waste arisings. Um, I don't know who, who is best placed to give me that um, high level overview. Uh, I think I know, uh, but uh, it's uh, always useful to hear it from those directly involved in the operation. Uh, tell me what La Colette is. What does it do? How long has it been there? Um, okay. Uh, La Colette's been there for quite a considerable time. Um, construction began in uh, 92 and then operation thereafter. And since that time, it's been receiving construction demolition wastes as um, inert landfill within this area. Um, as you can see on the screen, the site comprises of a number of different locations. So as currently stands, um, I believe this is probably the most recent aerial image, the eastern side of the site is the remaining... Um, could, could you just, um, with your cursor, just um, go around the outline of it, what, what's in and what's out? OK, certainly. Um, so from the northeastern side, you have the energy recovery facility with yeah. what's termed the northern mound behind it, which was the original um, engineered containment cells for incinerator ash prior to it being shipped off island. They are now complete and closed and continuously monitored. Um, working around the breakwater, so the entire site comprises effectively the rock armour sea wall that you can see there is the effective site boundary coming back inside of the fuel berth and uh, fuel storage compound um, and heading back up towards the NG recovery facility. That is the sort of boundary of La Colette phase two at the moment. Okay. 
Uh, so working clockwise around the site, um, the eastern headland is the currently um, operating contaminated waste receiving area. So those are the engineered cells that contaminated waste are stored in. Those two rectangles I can see there. It's actually considerably larger than that. It goes all the way down that eastern side to the southern tip um, and it's segregated in two separate parts. So the section being shown at the moment is the specific dedicated asbestos receiving cell where all separated asbestos materials are received and stored and disposed of. Um, and then the section to the northeast of that is the contaminated soils or CDE waste, uh, construction, demolition, excavation waste um, is stored within those cells. And that's the current um, superfilling area for contaminated wastes above the tidal flow. So they're not in the general fill of the Lacolette reclamation. They're all within their own contained areas. Uh, moving around the site, we then got the Household Recycling Centre for use by the general public. So that is a segregation um, site for those wishing to bring their waste to La Collette to be able to split out. And many different factions of waste from that site are sent away either for recycling or safer disposal, those that can't be managed on island. Um, adjacent to that, we have the uh, now vehicle scrapyard um, operated by a third party. So that receives waste vehicles and other metal scrap items. Adjacent to that is the aggregates recycling area, which is the site of the newly constructed um, soils washing plant, which is helping to um, increase the recycling rate of construction, demolition, and excavation wastes. Um, and that also facilitates the production of recycled aggregate for the island. And then heading further west up towards the tip of the site is the remaining inert landfill section um, that is now pretty much at a completed limit um, and is storing materials to allow for um, processing through the soils wash plant to try and extract as much recyclable material as possible. Okay. Um, understood. Is that a useful point for Mr. Jones to pick up and explain? I'm just going to. There's Sorry. two other sites actually in the middle. There's a green waste composting site where green waste gets composted, and the building next to that is a high temperature incinerator that takes healthcare waste. Right. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones. So there was a planning application lodged an age ago. I think it was 2016. Um, yeah. Can you tell me the story? Um, okay. Uh, planning application uh, received in 2016, as you say, for the formation of a headland, which is the headland to the east here. It's also included. Sorry. Could you could you point it out? Sorry. The... Yes. The the area where the engineered cells were uh, are that uh, Mr. Riv has referred to was the subject of the, the 2016 application. It's also included a little area to the south here, um, which uh, as yet hasn't been touched in terms of um, uh, any, any use at all. Um, so let me, let me be clear, the, prior to that application, the what was permitted there? Obviously, the the, the sea the sea defence that wall. It, was that that approved in that position? Yeah. What what we have? Um, perhaps I'll just go back a bit further. Then, um, in the mid nineties, um, the formation of the the rock armour uh, breakwater was approved, and the insertion of inert material to allow the base of what is La Colette now. And if I, if I just go back, if I, we've got a 1997 photograph, which is the earliest one I've got. This works, hopefully. That shows the position, um, 1997, um, where the breakwater had been constructed and then Yeah. 
I just, I mean, 2003, for example, you can start to see the, um, the land taking shape here. Um, there was a proposition in uh, 2000 uh, to the State's Assembly, which was for the formation of a, um, a large area of uh, mounding fill, if you like, which covered um, the area effectively around there. Also included the north, the north mound that uh, Mr. Riv uh, referred to. That was um, a state's proposition to allow um, uh, superfill, excuse me, <coughs> headland, if you like, in that location. Um, crucially, though, that was only a state's <coughs> resolution to approve and accept um, waste in this location. There wasn't any formal planning application mm -hmm. for that. Um, we weren't aware of that at the time of the 2016 application. And I think it's probably fair to say that we weren't aware of that until we assessed the 2016 application in, in some detail uh, prior to it going to planning committee in May 2022. Oh, Crocker, this is getting complicated already. So yeah. let me just make sure I'm, I'm, I'm picking this correctly. So what, what was the date of that proposition you mentioned? Uh, the proposition was uh, 2000. Uh, I can give you an exact date if you want. Uh, July, July 2000. And that was effectively saying, uh, this was the government saying, let's fill this site up. Yes, uh, it, it allowed for, uh, you know, for the continual disposal of waste. Um, and there's some crucial words here, um, and it said for as long as possible into the future through the creation of areas of superfill, <coughs> excuse me, and then to be used subsequently for the purposes of, of public open space and to serve as a landscaped buffer for the site. And how does that proposition sit alongside planning law? Well, that was the that was the, sorry. Yeah, the other thing I was just going to say that the, the proposition, the state's approval, didn't give any heights. It didn't say how high any mounds could go to. It simply allowed the um, area of land to be used for the yeah, for superfill, effectively. Um, no, and as I say... Sorry, it, I, I've got to ask more, more here. Yeah. Um, I, I know people want to ask questions, but please, if you just let, let me carry on my, my thread. Um, the state's proposition, are you saying that would trump planning law? Does it make planning permission... No longer required? No, no, it didn't. Planning permission um, wasn't sought yeah, for whatever reason at the time. Okay. Um, Miss, Mr. Young is going to... Yeah, please, yeah. I wonder if I can help on this, so I do remember it. Um, in those days, if I'm right in my... Sorry, should we, have, should we have the lights back up while yeah. we're talking? Because please. I think procedure, um, obviously, that is over 20 years ago, and states' procedures have changed a great deal. My recollection was, in those days, um, there was a requirement uh, under public finances law for major capital projects of the states to go and be approved by the states in principle. And that required the committee of the day, because it was a committee, it wasn't a ministerial system, it was a committee, to go to the states and to seek the state's approval to doing a project in principle. And in those, you know, in those days, the projects weren't worked up in depth, but the whole idea is they went with a concept. Uh, and obviously, the things that I particularly remember about that concept, it was very, very controversial. Um, and as I said earlier in my earlier remarks, the states did add in the concept of after use, that they were prepared to allow the 
states approved it. I believe if you go back to the state's record, you can go back to the state's minutes. In fact, I'm not sure there may even be um, there may even be things in the state's Hansard. I can't remember whether it's there, but you'll find that I think that it was important to members that they uh, uh, went with that in principle, with that which meant that then they could put funding in the budget because you couldn't put a capital project in the state's annual budget without getting the state's approval in principle first. And then also um, the, the vision was there that the, once the site had finished that use, that there would be after use. And it was a very controversial matter for the residents of Half Day Park who lived to the east yeah. because they were very concerned about the height of the mound. And there was a lot of discussion, but I do, I, my recollection is there wasn't any clarity about the height of the mound. But I know later on, which I am sure Mr. Jones is going to take us through, there was an application for superfill, I think, because in other words, the original, it wasn't envisaged they would have to superfill on the sites. So I think there was an important procedure in the day. That procedure has all been swept away. We had the ministerial system. We've got the new public finances law, which abandons that because so those procedures don't exist. So I think earlier on in the inquiry, we referred to the government plan. That is yeah. now the vehicle for such approvals. Uh, detrimental in my view, because it was useful in those days that um, people knew what was in the government plan. They, they had sufficient, they voted okay. for it. But now they haven't got, a, you know, we just vote for a line in the budget, which is, the, anyway, that's by the way, I won't deflect you, sir, but I just wanted to explain the background and the concept to that state's... OK, but if, if I'm clear, Mr. Young, whether it was the old system of the proposition uh, or whether it's the new system of the, the budget, for want of a, a, a better word, none of that bypasses the need for a project to go off and get its own planning approval. Well, you'd have to ask the lawyers. Um, personally, I don't think it does bypass the system because I do remember that in those days, I think this... The planning law as it now is wasn't in force. I think it was the island planning, island planning Jersey law, 1964. And in the early, uh, in the early 2000s, the states approved the planning and building law uh, in its uh, new version. Um, but actually, that wasn't actually implemented until 2006 because there was an argument over the appeals process, which is, you know, by the by. Uh, and so the, the law sat there approved, but didn't get implemented. And of course, we've since come on a number of gestations of the planning and building law, where appeals have been added and lots of other things have been added. So the law as it stands, okay. we're working within a law, which is, but I do not believe myself that you could argue, um, this is my memory as the chief officer at the time, I don't believe you could argue that that substituted for planning consent. Um, if you wanted an absolute opinion, you'd have to get the state's yeah. lawyers to tell you. I don't think I'll be that curious. Um, OK. Um, mm. let, let me... Let, well, let Mr Jones carry on with the, the thread, because... Okay. Uh, that, so, that... can I... Um, I might uh, just make an observation. It's not uh, primary research, but... Um, there's a, there's a current proposition from um, the Minister for Infrastructure uh, in relation to the uh, Lacolette Waste Management Yes, site. I think I'm aware of that. I was going to come on to that, yeah. Rather than... That records a planning history of the site. That records um, a series of planning applications uh, under what I know as the third ref for the site, which is the, when uh, sites were organised by uh, kind of a numerical order rather than by address. Uh, and that includes applications 17742, stroke A, stroke B, and stroke C, which, according to the narrative here, um, not that I've, I've unearthed those files, it um, refers to the relevant planning history to the reclamation site in relation to the um, deposition of waste is considered as commencing in 1993. Uh, permission was granted under application in October of that year, 17742, for the construction of the Rock Armour revetments. 
and that was followed by uh, application 17742A and B, which apparently enabled the filling of the reclamation site up to the level of the breakwater for inert waste and hazardous waste, respectively. And application 17742C allowed the landscaping of the northern mound to a height of 10 metres above the top of the breakwater. Okay. Um, well, in that case, uh, maybe my dates are wrong. Uh, I think this, the, the going back to the history, I, I'm not... The context of the laws, what were in effect at the time, yes. is, is right. But the exact history of what consents were issued where, okay. I think we'd have to rely okay. on what the planning officer tells us. Mr Nicholson, that proposition, I may have it somewhere. But I'll, I'll I, circulate it immediately. Yeah, it, it would be useful. We'll, we'll add it to the inquiry documents list. Yeah, I was going it, to come on to that, yeah. That was part of the, the, the trailer where we are. With okay. Things, so well, yeah. I, I, um, I'm going I'm to let Mr Jones carry on the, the, the storyline, otherwise it's going to get too fragmented, so right. please do. And if I could have the, the AL photograph back again, if possible, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, I mean, just for clarity, the, the planning applications that have just been mentioned, um, those only refer to uh, developments above the level of the, the rock armour, um, nothing above, apart from the northern mound, as, as Mr Nicholson says, was the, you know, the 10 metres above the uh, above Admiral, Admiralty Datum line. So, yeah, nothing above the breakwater level, effectively. Um, so there were two components to La Colette, effectively, in terms of um, waste disposal. Uh, we've got the, the contaminated areas here, and we've got the inert waste areas here. The, um, the 2016 application, as I say, was for the, the contaminated waste area here. There are separate applications in force approvals in force for the inert waste and aggregate recycling uh, facility. Uh, although talks are ongoing with the, um, our colleagues uh, in operations about the heights of those and how close they are to reaching the maximum levels uh, stated in previous permits. But that, that doesn't form part of the, the 2016 application although it does form part of the proposition. Um, okay, so the 2016 application hasn't been determined. Um, we, we come to... Uh, so, sorry, could you just explain yeah. with, with the 2016 application, yeah. uh, could, could you read me out the development description? Uh, and there, I know there is a reference to the part retrospective, and I want to understand what is the part retrospective bit. Okay, um, this, is, this is also altered during the life of the application up until the consideration by the planning committee um, in May 22, and then by the committee again in March 23. So the, the original 2016 application was for the formation of a headland uh, with an environmental impact statement submitted. So that was the original description. The okay, so it was just three words, formation of headland. Yes. Right. Yeah. Then it was amended. It was, uh, okay, it was then amended in 2018 with an addendum to the environmental impact statement. And that was also reflected in the description of, develop, of developments. That was the, the state of the planning application description when it was taken to the planning committee in May 2022 with a recommendation as officer level to approve. That application was then deferred at that planning committee. <clears throat> it wasn't. It was April as well, not May. 
It wasn't. Um, if I can just be allowed to. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it was taken to a planning committee in May 22. That was deferred. Uh, the committee wanted more information. They wanted more information on the proposed after use. But they also wanted further clarification in terms of up to date drawings uh, on where we were with the, the planning application. Um, there was then a, a period of time when that information was being um, collated and prior to its consideration by the March 2023 planning committee yep. and upon the receipt of those amended details, the description of development was amended again. What does it read now? Uh, it's, it's getting longer. Um, it included an address clarification. So it was area of land to the east of uh, the bus depot and ATP fuels. Can you point those out on the... Yeah, sorry. Photo. Yeah, so the, the bus depot is, is here. Yeah. And ATP fuels is... Um, is, is there, sorry. Yeah. Uh, to the east of the organic recycling centre, which is there. Yeah. Uh, to the, the south of the household, to the east and south, sorry, of the household recycling centre, which is there. and to the south of the metal recycling area, which is there. So that encompassed that area of land to the, the south, effectively. I've, I've seen a site plan with red lines, and it, it, there are two blobs with a small gap between them, aren't there? There, there is the larger red-lined area, which is on the east, as, we, as, as you highlighted. Mm. Then towards the south, there's a, a gap and then another red-lined area on that southern area. That's the correct plan I've looked at, yeah, is it? Yeah, that's right, yes, yeah. Um, now, in terms of what was, what was then part retrospective, um, if I just show you a plan of the, the headland, uh, sorry, a, a photograph makeup of the headland. Um, right. This was what was presented to the, the planning committee uh, when it, it considered the application in March 2023. So what the, um, the 2016 application was applying for in terms of the, the eastern mound was a mount height of the 41 metres above Admiralty Datum, which was that red line there. What has been done to date is a mound height of 30 metres above Admiralty Datum. That is the breakwater, which is the 14 metres, excuse me, <coughs> above Admiralty Datum. So effectively, the difference between 14 and the 30 is what is the retrospective element of the application. So do, those figures were... 41 was the applied for. 41 right. was applied for. And just for context, I've given, I've given the, the uh, above admiralty datum height of the energy recovery facility, which is that building there. And 30 is the current. 30 is current. And the breakwater is 14. 14. AAD. Yeah. So you're saying there's 16 metres 
depth of fill there, which are you saying that is not covered by a planning permission? The, the planning application was refused by planning committee uh, at its March 2023 meeting uh, for three, three, three concerns. Um, and those were, um, they were concerned about the, uh, the positive enhancement uh, of the site in terms of landscape or coastal character. They were concerned about um, the proposal having in adverse impacts on the skyline, uh, views and landmarks by its height, profile, scale and so forth. And they were concerned that there wasn't uh, a proper after use proposed. So those were their concerns that were, which were aired at the March 2023 meeting. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but over here... I'm aware of the cool-off. The cool-off, yeah, yes. Okay. So it went back the following month. It went back the following month with those three reasons for refusal firmed up. Um, the committee uh, didn't ratify that decision. So there is no, no decision on this 2016 application as yet. Did, did it minute its reasons for not ratifying the decision? Um, the reason they have deferred it was because they want to see uh, two separate planning applications submitted. The first application, which has to be submitted to enable it to be considered at a planning committee in September of this year. was for the retrospective works to date. So they wanted an application for what had been done to date in retrospect so they could consider that. Okay. Application number two um, is for what our colleagues in uh, IE operations would like to see provided for at La Colette effectively in the short and medium term to allow the longer term to be considered in more detail. So I think I, I understand that they Oh, well, well, actually, where, where does that leave the undetermined application? Will that be withdrawn? Um, that is one of the unknowns at the moment. Um, okay. But if the planning committee, if the planning committee's uh, wishes um, are followed through by the applicant, mm. there will be a planning application to, the, the first planning application to basically seek to put its house in order mm. in terms of that um, current situation that I see on the screen up to 30 metres um, AAD, mm. um, that 16 uh, over the breakwater level. Yeah. And then the second application that it is inviting is, now am I to interpret short to medium term as don't come back with 41 metres. Is, is that what they're saying? I don't know. I don't you know don't what. Know. They, they've left it, uh, a couple of things, in in uh, having a you know, stay of abeyance, if you like, for six months, which is what it is. They are clear that the existing headland can't be raised in height. 
apart from um, that level of inert material required you know, to cap off the existing engineered cells in that headland. So there are, in that headland, there are some engineered cells. Um, they accept that there might be a level, a slight level, uh, one, two metres, whatever, of additional inert waste to cap off and tidy up that headland. But their instructions are that the headland cannot be raised in height. Um, the second application. Was the, okay. Sorry, okay. Yes. Um, application number two has to be with the uh, authority, the department, prior to the the 6th of September 2023 committee to show... Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, yeah. The uh, application number two... Yeah, the which, date. ...which is the one that um, needs to uh, be considered for the short and medium term, has to be with the, the department prior to the first application's committee um, consideration at the 6th of September 23 committee. So the... The first application has to go to the 6th of September committee. The second one has to be in the system by that time. The, in doing so, um, the committee are obviously mindful of the implications for closing La Colette and the, the two application process enables La Colette to be operational, although only to a, to a certain extent, and, and perhaps Mr. Mr. Reeve can, can tell us how much there is left in terms of capacity without going above that 31, 30 metres height. Um, in the meantime, and to further complicate matters, um, there was reference to Proposition. Sorry, can we can we have the lights up, please? I failed to do it properly last time, so I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Right. Um, the on the sixth of April, uh, twenty twenty-three, uh, the Minister for Infrastructure, who has. Um, in, within whose remit La Colette falls, uh, lodged a proposition to the, the State's Assembly to effectively consider La Colette um, as the only site for the reception of contaminated and inert waste in the short and medium term. That is now due to be debated by the State's Assembly on the 18th of July, 2023. I've just got that in front of me now. And if that proposition were to be accepted by the State's Assembly, what, what does that mean? Um, I think what the intention of the Infrastructure Minister is, uh, is to try and get uh, Assembly support for the, the principle of La Colette remaining and receiving inert and contaminated waste until at such time the, the government can consider a longer term strategy. And I think uh, he feels that if there is assembly weight behind that, then that 
um, is a material consideration for the consideration of any planning application that will be that is going to be submitted before September. Crikey! That 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 forms a number of well, one or two of, of the unknowns. Um, yeah, the unknown, the first unknown, is whether or not planning committee will accept the planning application in retrospect for the, the headland to date. Um, whether or not that proposition is agreed in principle by the state assembly, and whether or not planning committee will accept the submitted planning application for the the short and long term, medium and long term solution at La Collette. Those are three unknowns. So, yeah, so technically, at this moment in time, um, there's no planning permission for the receipt of contaminated waste uh, apart from, and this is um, an isolated planning approval for one of the asbestos cells in this area here, which was approved in 2015. So that has planning permission. So, yes. in terms of that 2016 application then, no decision on it doesn't feel like there is likely to be a decision on it uh, because the committee has said I want planning application one and planning application two. Mm. Planning application one will not, which the, the retrospective one for what, what we see on, on that photograph, um, that will not be determined before September this year. Yeah. And in application two, um, I sensed from what you were saying, the Minister for Infrastructure is seeking to prepare the political ground and garner support for Akalet remaining as the main site for the foresee well, short, medium term. Yeah. But that planning application uh, may not be submitted until the autumn and may not be determined until it would be into next year, would it? Uh, potentially, yes. That, that, that application, the only uh, parameter at the moment is that that second application has to be with us in the system before the committee consider the first application in September 23. Are both applications going to be prescribed under the EIA regs? Committee have agreed that the first application doesn't, doesn't have to be, but they wish the second application... Can it do that? Sorry? Can it do that? Well, there is an environmental impact assessment... Um, oh, it, it could piggyback on that yes. one that's yes. been done because yes. yeah. So, yeah, sorry, yes, sir. yes. So there's no requirement for a new EIA for the retrospective works because that will be updated. But there is a requirement for a new environmental impact assessment for, for the second application, and I believe work is in hand to start the preparation work for that. Crikey. Um, just before I go to Mr. Yard, I just want to go to the applicant side and you could see what I was doing there, what, what I'd, I'd asked Mr. Jones to do. He's just sort of tracking through the chronology so uh, I, I understand and I, I stress probably for about the third or fourth time today, um, I'm really not going to stand in judgment on these matters other than to say that they are unusual to, to, to say the least. You, you might be back standing in judgment on them in... Uh, Sorry, the... You might be back in September. <laughs> too, I don't think so. I don't think... Well, I, let's, let's hope not. Um, but, but what I am picking up from 
uh, that account is, um, well, would it be an understatement to call this a, a, a waste management crisis on the island? I, I've got no doubt to explain, uh, to, to do anything other than fall in behind the um, position that Mr Jones outlined. I, I sat through the uh, application meeting in, I think it was March this year, when the application, uh, when, when the first resolution of the committee was, was made. Um, it's uh, not a proposal that I've been in, involved in. My only thoughts are that I, I think... Um, the position of the Assembly uh, was um, actually quite clear when they uh, concluded the um, Bridging Island Plan uh, just 12 months ago, just over 12 months ago, uh, because in there there is a, you know, a, a, a clear acknowledgement that the um, waste, um, uh, the approach to waste is in line, it needs to be in line with the uh, solid waste strategy and um, my understanding of the uh, solid waste strategy uh, is that La Colette is remaining as the uh, primary um, uh, source for, for receiving waste. And uh, the furthermore, my understanding of the solid waste strategy uh, is that there is an acceptance that there will need to be uh, superfill at La Colette. Uh, and that forms the basis for the, the, the island plan approach to the, how waste is to be dealt with. But so, that, that doesn't solve the issue that we've heard that it doesn't have planning permission. Uh, correct, sir. My, my views were about the uh, manner in which that resolution occurred um, almost out with the position that the island plan actually establishes. I thought the um, position that the committee took was as if they had no idea that there was even a waste site at Aqualet. Right, hang on a sec. Just... I think, um, just in terms of the uh, solid waste strategy, the uh, particularly in relation to uh, asbestos, the um, 2005 strategy is, is quite clear. Uh, is that uh, to quote, so the intention is to continue with the disposal of this type of solid uh, hazardous waste in insecure pits in the short term. If no sites can be identified in the island when uh, La Colette is full, it may be necessary to export this. Uh, the, the, these issues that the uh, current proposition and the, and the planning committee are grappling with, I, I think, have been rehearsed in previous uh, iterations of the same debate. Okay, I've got a question that I just have to ask Mr Monks. I do stress I, I'm really not here to stand in judgment on this other planning application, which, uh, uh, but it, it does affect the planning application that I am, am, am reporting on. But I've got to ask, um, you know, when we saw that uh, picture that Mr Jones and he explained to me that there is you know, 60 metres depth of landfill that hasn't got planning permission, I mean, that really is extraordinary. And how, how has that situation actually arisen? Because if it were your role as re regulating waste, if this were to be a private waste operator taking a corner of Jersey and, <laughs> and landfilling it with all, with, with all sorts, um, you'd surely be onto them straight away, wouldn't you? So well, explain to me... Um, as yeah, un under the Waste Management Law, which um, <clears throat> was implemented in 2007, eight, we can't issue a waste management licence for a site that's dealing with waste, unless yeah, a, a it's site that's... that's dealing with waste in some way, whether it's keeping it, treating of it, disposing of it, whatever it's doing. So if a site needs a waste management licence, we can't give them a waste management license unless they've got planning permission. But they, they didn't so, have planning permission. You know, the site was created in the 90s yeah. before the waste management law even existed. Right. By the time the waste management law came in in 2007 and 8, and they were considering an application from the government to license that site, what the law did, it basically gave a 
a retrospective carrying on of waste activities that were already happening in the island prior to the law coming into force so that they could carry on as long as they made an application. So the government of Jersey, as the operator of La Colette site and various other sites, made applications under the law. <clears throat> and then that could, be, that could carry on in a lawful way until that application under the waste law was determined. So the department said, right, government that's applied for a waste management license, thanks for your application, we're going to consider it. Has the site got planning permission? So we asked the question back in 2007 and 8, and we got the answer, yes, there's a reclamation that's got, the, the rock armour wall's got permission, there's permission to reclaim land from the sea, there's permission to put uh, certain hazardous waste in the form of asbestos into that site, and that's what happened at the time. So the licence wasn't actually issued until 2013 for La Colette. Prior to that, the, the licence for the uh, energy from waste plant was being considered. Yep. Um, there was lots of other things going on. So to answer your question, I think, coming back to that, um, yeah, if somebody was doing a waste activity and they didn't have planning permission to do it and we found out about it, as a government regulator, we'd go to them and say, uh, you haven't got planning permission and you haven't got a waste management licence, what's going on here? But in the case of La Colette, the activities were happening prior to the waste management law being written and implemented. At the time the licence was being considered, we asked, has the site got planning permission? And the answer was yes. The final agreed landform of the headland and what that might turn out to be wasn't really being considered at that time. Mm -hmm. I was given the answer, yes, it's got planning permission. Some of the references John uh, Nicholson read out earlier, I forget them, 197, in relation to that um, yep. proposition that are listed there, were, was the response in terms of me asking the question, well, has this site got planning permission? Um, so I think somebody asked earlier about implications of closing La Colette. I don't know where that came from, Chris, in terms of the... Um, I heard that being asked about. But, you know, but in terms of environmental protection and outcomes, um, the, the planning status at the site and where they've got to in terms of creating better landfill-engineered practice at that eastern side of the site needs resolving, absolutely. The license that we've issued and that we sort of regulate the activity on a day-to-day -day basis on um, is a good tool of a government regulator ensuring environmental protection from activities that government carries out. So, you know, it's a good thing, in my view. Okay. Um... And, well, let me ask a similar question of the, the planning authority. I mean, this is this is very major development, not covered by planning approval, um, and it seems whatever Mr. Monks was led to believe, uh, it should have been apparent to the planning authority from, I guess, from the receipt of the 2016 application, that uh, there was something awry here. Um. I don't think there was. I think there's always the acceptance that La Colette was the, the, the site to receive um, contaminated material. Um, the permission was given in, in 2015, as I said, for the asbestos cell. I don't think that was cross-referenced again at the time with the, the history of La Colette, as perhaps it should have been at the time. Uh, I think the 2016 application was just taken as um, as being at the formation of the headland because that's where contaminated waste had to go as part of the you know, the solid waste strategy uh, and as part of um, um, you know, the agreed location for it. So I think 
Um, the only proper interrogation, for whatever reason, was done 2022-2023, um, which is where we are now. And it's at that time point where what, you discovered that there was 16 metres of landfill that was not covered by a planning approval. Mm. Not, not covered by planning approval, but was was formed by uh, proper engineered cells. You know, the, the cells were, were properly constructed and um, uh, and properly receiving uh, waste. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that regulatory sort of work, I mean, the way I view it is land use planning is one thing about whether something should exist in a certain place. And in terms of waste management law, the waste management licence requires the operator of that activity, waste activity in this case, to come up with a method to show that they are not impacting the environment, humans near the site, creating emissions that shouldn't be happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. So, you know, there's a level of, level of regulatory control of the site, notwithstanding that in planning terms, they hadn't decided how, how, how this mine was, mound was going to go. There was a level of regulatory control through the licence that was about the day-to-day -day operation of the site, what site it was, what, what waste it would receive, how it would operate, um, which was a level of control Jersey didn't have at all until the implementa implementation of waste management law in 2006-07. Mm. Crikey. So that's progress. <laughs> Right, well, I mean, thank you for that sort of candid explanation of it. It's, um, uh, it's incredibly messy. It's, um, I, I suppose, just moving to where I need to go with this, I say I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make any sort of judgmental um, comments within my report on what's happened over, over that long period of time, but I will be recording... Uh, it in, in a factual uh, basis because I need to sort of plant those facts there to explain to the minister what we were talking about earlier this morning the what was it 113,000 cubic meters of stuff that needs to go somewhere um, and it strikes me right now there is huge uncertainty uh, from a planning perspective about where that will go that Uncertainty might change as, as, as time goes on, but uh, Mr. McCarthy, you seem very keen to say something. Well, I'm not keen. <laughs> no, I can still ask you. you need the mic. You need the mic. This is sorry. Um, I just want to make sure that you. Um, I fill in the gaps that have been missed from the presentation. Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, one of. One of the bits is that land was gifted to the islanders by the Queen. And we're, it's the islanders' land, not the government's land. And ultimately, anybody who dumps hazardous waste on that land without a licence is the owner that ultimately is responsible. So it's us. But we've got a management. The Department of Infrastructure are managing it. Now... If I can, I'm going to be very, I've got the long, long thing or the short one. The short one, I'm going to be very simplistic, so forgive me on the simplicity. But I, in 2016, well, sorry, what was agreed? We're going to fill in that lap, the, the, the beach. We're going to fill it up with inert waste. And then we're going to relocate a commercial harbour with all the sheds and everything. And that would have liberated Elizabeth Quay next door to our site, and there would have been a 1,000 homes provided. Fantastic. The 2016 planning application was driven by uh, Longwa recycling building material needed a place to, you know, and others needed to dump inert waste. Well, it was full. So then they said in 2016, we'll do a planning application to increase the, the height and build a mound. Um, 30 meters long, 30 meters of OD, high, 50 metres wide and 300 metres long, a mound. And that mound would become landscaped. So all the public would go down there and have picnics with their kids and enjoy the whole mound. And there's a drawing. The environmental impact assessment, which is, in fact, 
uh, was very simple because you know it's just a mound of <coughs> inert waste. And the scoping opinion was decided between the planning officer and the Department of Infrastructure only. There was no consultation with consultees, no consultation with uh, the public at all. So we're starting with the environmental impact statement of 2016 for an inert hill. What actually happened after that? You know, we've got the thing of the 2018, we've got the restructuring government, we've got uh, created the uh, growth, housing and environment, uh, which was a conflict of interest while the Attorney General opposed it and John arrived as the planning minister without a department, independent department. The government accepts it was a mistake. They accept it's made, and now they're restructuring it. Housing's been pulled off. Now, but we were promised by the chief minister within the first 100 days, they would have separated the two. So we're all agreed it's important that infrastructure and planning are separate bodies. But they're still not uh, separate bodies. The, the next thing that happened was they put in this planning application, which is a retrospective planning application. But Mr. Carthy, I, I can't... No, no, it is important no, 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 stop, please stop talking over me. You, you, you keep doing that. I, I've un, what I did, I've examined the submissions on this, and I've, I think I've got a pretty good understanding of the factual position. Now, the key factual position that I'm going to include in my report is that planning permission does not exist for what we saw on the photograph. And I will explain to the Minister uh, about the planning committee's uh, request for two applications. So there is no planning permission. No, no, now, but, but, but you said you were going to fill in the gaps. Now, I'm happy that you yes, do that, yes. but is it going to change that factual That's, finding? Yes, because I want to add on... So you're going to tell me there is a planning permission? No, what I'm trying to say is your advice, your duties as a, an inspector, as would be in the UK, that if you discovered in examining a planning application that there was a conflict of interest that existed that was likely to harm the public and the public were not aware, it would be your duty to inform the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State, as they've done before, would then in, um, implement an inquiry which could possibly lead to the closing down of the planning department and the government, as happened in Tower Hamlets, and putting them under directive, as happens in Liverpool. So I am asking, yes, that, and I'm pointing out the environmental impact assessment that supported a planning application, a retrospective planning application, that contains hazardous waste is based on an inert waste. The other thing is they did not provide in that planning application the as-built drawings. They showed an outline of amount. What we're talking... The other aspect is when it was reviewed by the same department, the critical thing when you've got hazardous waste in these cells is the drainage. We're next door to the Ramsar site. This is one of the most important ecological marine wetlands in the world. And we have legal responsibility to protect it international law. And the other aspect is the review, if you look at the planning application, under planning you have to provide two things, sections and drainage. The review of drainage, there isn't any. So what I'm trying to get across is that if you discover, uh, and you can see my objections in the planning, that I've highlighted the, the reality that the planning application was both inadequate misleading and false on the grounds that it did not provide the as-built drawings it should have done for the retrospective planning application. The environmental impact assessment su supporting it was for a 2016 outdated EIA, which was for inert waste mound only. And that was both inadequate, misleading and false and omissions in the planning. So I would like that to be reported back that it's not just a case they haven't got planning, they submitted a misleading, false uh, planning application with omissions that are extremely serious. 
and they're not serious just under Jersey law, they're international laws here. <coughs> it's serious under international law and obligations which should be considered. And in the UK, that would be done by the environmental agency. So I'd ask that, that, that it should be, uh, if there is going to go forward to recommendation, that the, the islanders deserve having the environmental agency of the UK to review. Thank you. Thank you. I've written that down. Uh, I'll come back. Please. Sorry, can I just come back? Sorry, quickly. Um, I think a couple of things. I think the more serious element of this is the inference of a professional integrity without any due basis of any any um, any evidence to that effect. Uh, at the 2016 application stage, uh, infrastructure and planning were not part of the same department. Um, the, the 2016 application um, was for um, contaminated cells as well. It was widely advertised, as was the amended submission prior to going to committee uh, in March 2023. So I think uh, a number of inaccurate statements being made, which I think also need to be corrected uh, before moving on. Well, if, it, if, if one reads the, all my objections to the plan um, and read, read the EIA, you'll, you'll see it specifically says, and you'll look at the scoping, it states okay. what it says. But I agree, I did not say, I meant that by then, in 2018, the, the joining of together of the two departments happened. Um, not the other aspect is on the definitions of work. We should be using the definitions of work to inform the Bible Convention and the Bible uh, Convention and the um, uh, Jersey Planning Law uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, hazardous waste. The word contaminated soil is a meaningless word, like that. It means nothing. It's either toxic, hazardous, or inert. Right? And if he wants to enter, we've got permission for contaminated. Well, it's like putting salt in a glass of water, all the difference about it in passing. They're both contaminated. So I ask that from here on, we should use the proper term, and what we're talking about is hazardous waste, not contaminated waste. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, Mr. Weibach. Um, you asked for an explanation as to why this pile at La College had risen way beyond what the law said it ought to be. And we got an explanation, which I think is a valid one, but there's also a human one, which is that the planning department so far, in the last, certainly the last 15 years, have got a very poor record in enforcing conditions that they lay down. And that's not just my view, it's a view of a, a large number of people who have to deal with breaches of the conditions. So the reason I'm raising it is that there may well be a need for you to put some conditions into your whole consent uh, to this development, but I wish you to bear in mind that the record so far is very poor. Thank you. Mr Young. Yes, on the same theme. Obviously, it's not a happy story, um, but as you say, sir, we are where we are, and you've got to make a judgment now on an application um, which relies upon um, a waste processing facility that has no approvals in place and under the Bridging Island Plan clearly says is fast reaching the end of its life. And so the factual question that would arise, which I'm sure you may, you're going to go on to deal with, is, well, is it at its end of its life now and how much capacity does it have and does it have capacity to deal with the waste of risings as a result of this application at the current time. Uh, I, I put that question, I'm sure you're going to go on to, to address that now. I hope you are, sir, because that... Yeah, that ab um, absolutely. And I, I think it does actually help me move on in the, the agenda because I want to uh, sort of explore, well, what does all this mean? Uh, there's you know, incredible un un uncertainty. And... Sorry, you were going to... Yes, I was just going to add a, an extra reason. I think, obviously, as the Minister, during the disruptive phase of the state's reorganisation, there's no... This is an open secret. I've said so in the states openly many times. It was very disruptive. 
very disruptive. The whole structure of government was turned upside down. Many people left the organisation. The organisation lost a lot of major skills and major people, which was really regrettable. We went through a very bad phase, uh, and I think we are still settling down from that change. I think things are now better now. Um, we've got a commitment from the new government for change, which I really hope they deliver uh, and, and achieve that separation because though I absolutely accept that I think that, um, that I, you know, though there was a perception of conflict of interest that people were not happy with, um, but I don't think that that is, was fair to criticise the individuals or in no. any way at all in their professionalism. I certainly have always seen professionalism but things do get very muddy in such a structure. It's going to change. And so, sir, I think um, I think I add that as a reason uh, why possibly um, things did happen during that period. It was very disruptive. OK, I'm going to just move this on slightly. I, I'd, I'd like to... I absolutely agree with the... The auditor, you should worth reading the auditor's report on the failures of the regulation department, the failures to protect the public from harm. The second issue is there was no director of regulation appointed from March 2020 to, um, so none in 2020, none in 21. There hasn't been a chief officer of planning appointed since March 2020. So what I wanted to point out, it's not just we're dealing with a planning. We're totally, totally dependent on this outline planning application with a volume of reserve matters. We're totally dependent on the conditions and we don't have the machinery that's independent that the public can trust. And I do take the point, because whether we see it can't, so it doesn't make any difference whether it isn't trustworthy or it is seen to be untrustworthy. The, government, the public don't have that as, as the audit officer. As okay, Mr. McCarthy, I've noted that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. R right. Um, yeah, well, let me ask a question, which is where, where I want to want to steer us now, uh, in terms of what I've done in terms of the fact finding there. Um, what I'd like to explore, starting with Mr. Monks and Mr. Mr. Riv, uh, is if we bring pull together some of the strands of what we've. Um, uh, discovered and agreed earlier in the day, and we, we talk about this 113,000 cubic metres of waste that needs to go somewhere, albeit this is over quite a long period. Um, it would be the, uh, what, 10 or 12 year yeah. period? Yes, sir. We're looking in our um, documents, it would start around 2025. Um, and then, yes, you're right over about a 10-year period, sort of 2034. And you're, so you're not looking at 113,000 no, cubic meters at once. No, it's not all going to arrive in one No, day. it's going to arrive in dribs and drabs. Uh, OK, but it, it's it's a obviously a significant quantity of uh, waste waste material. What I want to explore um, this side of the table is what, what I've heard around the planning situation. There, there are different scenarios aren't, aren't there. there. There is the scenario today where there is not planning approval uh, for what's there at the moment, let alone for anything beyond that, the first and the second applications that the uh, planning committee have, have asked for. Uh, but there was some discussion that there is still, so it, or did, I, did I hear this correct? Within the existing site, there is some capacity, is there? And if so, how much? Um, that's probably quite a difficult answer to give at this present moment until the ratification of the first planning application. Um, if you were to take the verbatim words of the planning committee, that the effective shape of the mound shouldn't change from where it is at present and should only entail uh, capping of that existing therefore the mound is complete and there would not be any capacity for contaminated materials um, if you looked at it in a more uh, 
reasonable frame of mind that the committee would not want to see the headland increasing above the 30 metre um, height that it currently sits at. Uh, there is a, an existing design for the profile of the headland that we would effectively maintain that similar profile, but at the reduced height of the 30 metres to effectively um, track that 30 metres down to the rock armour height of 14 metres near the asbestos um, containment cell, um, which would allow us to still continue receiving waste and the analysis of that capacity is currently being done. Could, could you put a figure on that, if that what you call a pragmatic <laughs> scenario? I don't know if I could without being held to it. At the moment, we are doing that modelling. Uh, well, is, is that going to be of the order of 113,000 cubic metres? I would err on the side of caution that it would not be enough for the 113,000 cubic metres. Plus, you've got all the other waste arisings from... That's correct. Other we have other sites that do bring us waste and will need managing um, and residues from other operations on the island. OK, so that I'm clear on scenario number one, which is where, where we are right now. Let's take scenario number two, um, which is where the... Minister for Infrastructure is successful in his ambition to get the retrospective application approved uh, and a second application, which... Now, that second application, I guess, is a, a bit of an unknown... Well, it's an unknown for me, um, but that second application is clearly... The objective of it would be to achieve more capacity at the site. That is correct, yeah. It's not been decided whether or not the second application will follow the same form as the first with the 40 metre uh, height being requested. Uh, we're more likely to um, include alternate options for consideration by the um, planning committee of varying heights and assessing the capacity of contaminated waste that that provides for the island and how that would compare to expected waste arising that we're currently aware of that would require disposal within that headland. Okay. And again, a, probably a difficult, if not impossible, question to answer. Um, that second application, are you able to put any figures on likely volumes? Um, or could you put a figure on a every metre um, above that 30 metres that we saw? Unfortunately, it's not quite that easy to do because, as you've seen in the image, the construction is stepped, so you're actually talking about very irregular shapes. It, it would be wonderful to be able to say there is a square platform and every metre of that square platform yeah. was X capacity. There's also the percentage of capacity lost due to the construction of the cells themselves. That also needs to be taken into consideration during the modelling. So that's also a process we're going through is to demonstrate the actual construction proposal internally of the mound to be able to verify the capacities at each stage of that height. Um, if you look at each option that we would be generating, um, it would form a different profile and therefore the footprints of each uh, engineered cell inside that would need to change and therefore your available volumes change quite dramatically based upon the sort of contouring and general shape of the headland. Okay. And, well, let me take you through the, well, I suppose from waste management, your nightmare scenario, which is um, that the applications are submitted. Um, the first one's refused. The second one is refused. What happens then? I believe in that scenario, that would have to be the government's decision about how it moves forward. Uh, we as an operator are facilitating the government's strategy um, and trying to facilitate waste disposal in the island. Um, there is no legal obligation for the government to provide, provide waste disposal within the island. It's a service that has been provided historically and the government has continued to provide. 
and in practical terms that would effectively stymie developments such as the ones promoted and potentially others on brownfield sites within the built-up area. That, that no could be the case, um, but we would fall back onto the waste hierarchy, which the applicant has demonstrated that yeah. um, minimisation, treatment, reuse of waste would be um, would need to become an absolute priority. Um, they already are in the planning phase. Um, but you, always, you always end up with a residual, don't you? There, there will be situations whereby treatments or stabilisations cannot achieve uh, inert status of material and therefore they would remain contaminated. Um, and this is the clarification I was going to make in response to Mr McCarthy before. We actually worked to the EU landfill directive whereby there's three categorisations of waste. There is inert, stable non-reactive contaminated and then hazardous waste. Um, La Colette will only actually receive stable, non-reactive contaminated waste, not hazardous wastes. Um, so, so these let me, are waste. Let me make sure I get these terms down co correctly. Just, just run, go through that slowly. So you've got uh, inert wastes, which are stable and will not potentially contaminate the environment or be a risk to human health. Yeah. You've got stable, non-reactive contaminated wastes. That stable, non-reactive. Sorry, say it, say it again. Stable? Stable, non-reactive, contaminated wastes. Yeah. And those are wastes that potentially are harmful to the environment but will not uh, change their um, composition over time by breaking down, such as would be expected with putrescible wastes or um, other more hazardous wastes. So you store them safely and they're okay? So. Uh, that's the idea behind the um, contained engineered cells is that by breaking that uh, source pathway receptor model, we've provided containment of those materials so that they are not of a risk to the environment and they're constantly monitored um, from source pathway and receptor to demonstrate that, that break and that linkage. Okay, and the third category? The third one is hazardous, which Lacolette does not accept. And those are those materials which, will, which are not stable and change their composition over time either by um, co-mingling of waste or just by their own natural degradation. So examples of those being? Uh, radioactive wastes, high organic wastes, acidic wastes, um, high um, pH wastes, um, those with uh, explosive properties, uh, any waste like that, La Colette does not accept. And there is a... And those types of hazardous waste, the reports that we were hearing about this morning, we're not finding that stuff? Uh, not at present, no. The, the wastes are presenting okay. as stable, non-reactive. And things such as asbestos would fall into that middle category, stable, non-reactive, contaminated? That's correct, they would. Okay. Uh, right. The, the only caveat to that is asbestos itself is deemed a hazard um, when it's in its free form. And that's so that, why that's we have as a hazardous waste in its own yeah. Way. That's why we have the segregated asbestos cell to keep that separate. Okay, Mr. McCarthy again. Can you in the mic, please? Oh, um, what we're dealing with is um, in the site. It's just not, this is not asbestos. There's brown asbestos, there's fibrous asbestos, uh, high, you know, high insulation uh, material for, for um, boilers, etc. And then um, it's all broken. It's, you know, the, 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 the actual hard uh, is broken fibers of asbestos. That's all mixed up with the material, so it's mixed waste. And uh, I, will, I will provide what, what I understand uh, from the documentation, the how, uh, if, you, if I apply today uh, to get a license, so I've gone online and they have a list and uh, asbestos to IC is in the list uh, of hazardous waste. Um, we mustn't mix it up with the other uh, pile, uh, which is a temporary storage of, if you broke, you know, your, 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 your garden shed, you took the, the asbestos down and you, they keep it there until they find a, a way of disposing of it. Um, but what we're talking about is this very fine word we're getting into is hazardous waste. But what we're, then I would go back 
has they got, you know, when you've defined asbestos being delivered to the site, are you saying there is a license in place today to dump that on that mound without planning consent? I, I think my understanding on asbestos was that there was a permitted containment facility there. Was it a 2015 permission? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. The, 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 that's separate. What I'm saying is this, the excavation already has been carried out from the waterfront, delivered to the site, in, and there are different definitions. I'm saying it's a hazardous waste. They've got another definition. Does that other definition have a licence to be dumped on the, above the inert waste mound? Does it have a licence to do that? However you want to define your waste. Does it have a licence today? Because I don't know how it can have a licence because it has not planning consent. And you need planning consent in accordance with Jersey law first before as you, uh, before you can actually apply, apply for a, a licence. And when you apply for a licence, you've got a whole host of public consultation to do. It's not a simple one off plan. The only bit I would point out in the environmental impact assessment, and sorry, the comments made by the committee, the planning committee, the planning committee have no training at all from this government to help them understand environmental impact assessments. And this is highly complex. And I think it's totally unfair that the expecting a planning committee of lay people to make a planning consent over such a level. And the whole, the other aspect I would add, after the, the planning committee re rejected the planning application, for very good reason, I put in supporting information about the EIA and they don't have the necessary information to make any decision. I would follow that through. There was a private meeting with the uh, uh, Minister of the, of the Environment, who's making the planning application, private meeting with the planning committee. And after that planning committee, the planning committee decided to defer. There's no public were involved in that meeting. So I'm not allowed to talk to the planning committee about a, plan a planning application. And as far as I understand, neither can the applicant have a private meeting with the planning committee. And I think the minutes from that meeting should be published. Sir, could I briefly interject? My colleague Sarah online just wanted to add something on the, Certainly, yes. the categories of waste, as it is a great complex area. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Um, I think I just wanted to clarify a little bit about how we classify waste in the UK, um, and which is still the same as in the EU. European Waste Catalogue um, sorts waste into hazardous and non-hazardous waste. Contaminated waste isn't a term. Inert waste is a subset of non-hazardous waste. In terms of landfill directive controls, it then sets leach values on wastes to go into different types of containment engineering cells. So for non-hazardous waste to be disposed of as inert waste, it needs to meet certain leaching tests limits um, and it, it needs to have suitably low organic content to not pose a gas risk. Um, hazardous waste, for it to be disposed of, a stable, non-reactive, hazardous waste, um, it needs to meet lower leaching limits than hazardous waste. So I'm afraid I don't recognise a term of um, stable, non-reactive, contaminated waste. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I, I think pure form to European Landfill Directive and what we do in Jersey in those terms. It is quite a complex area. Um, in Jersey, and I'll go on in my brief to talk about why we're allowed to export certain wastes um, and for disposal and why we're not others. And one of those aspects is to do with the way the landfill environment in Jersey differs to the landfill environment in the UK where you've got 
25 metres of London clay underneath a landfill site in the home counties or Bedfordshire, which is completely different to a marine environment with plastic liners and engineered cells. So I, I can see that uh, there is a difference be between the way we in Jersey define waste, and it's, it's because we're not entirely... We haven't got landfill directive compliant landfills in Jersey. We've only got one. It's at La Colette, and we use engineering standards to try and create the best containment environment that we do. So I, I see what you're saying, Sarah, but in terms of the inert landfill that we've got in Jersey, we want that material to be inert. We've got some waste ex acceptance criteria that roughly map what European uh, waste acceptance criteria are. And then if something is doesn't meet those criteria, it doesn't necessarily become hazardous waste. We call it contaminated because it's not inert. But we don't call it hazardous because it doesn't meet the hazardous definition. So there is this kind of middle ground within the landfill operators, uh, the license and the way, you know, they develop the working plan and have waste acceptance criteria in Jersey that recognises the word contaminated. But I appreciate what you're saying, Sarah, in European parlance, you've got waste acceptance criteria for landfills, non-hazardous landfills, which includes stable non-reactive hazardous waste, a key example being asbestos, and then waste that meets a hazardous definition, but also needs to meet waste acceptance criteria for a hazardous landfill. There's lots of complexity. I'm not sure whether, whether this is going to inform your decisions about what you need to know for the inquiry, I, but I don't think quite happy to try probably, and... It's probably getting a bit too technical and detailed yeah. to me. I'd, um, OK, but useful to hear. Um, Good. Well, in relation to, I was going to ask, you know, I mean, if you want us to try and answer the questions that are kind of coming from the floor, I'm quite happy to try and do that. Um, Mr McCarthy, earlier, I think you were asking about whether there was permissions to take hazardous waste at La Colette. From my perspective, issuing the waste management licenses which seek to regulate those activities, I'm quite clear that earlier permissions to allow the rock armour wall and the infilling included the disposal of certain hazardous waste, which, which was asbestos. Because there's lots of asbestos cement bonded material, which is now, in 2023, defined as a hazardous waste that's gone into La Colette. Um, underneath mean high water springs on the entire area of that eastern headland. And then when they've come above high mean high water, they've created cells to put bottom ash and certain other things. And one particular cell in 2015 got permission for permanent disposal of asbestos. And the majority of that asbestos had been stored in shipping containers for a number of years, which was licensed asbestos in health and safety parlance. So it's the more hazardous, more able to release fibres type of asbestos as opposed to your corrugated garage roof, which is bonded. Um, and all that's gone into cell 30 and another area uh, and that's got planning permission and it's got a separate waste management license. So I, I think the answer is yes. It's, I mean, notwithstanding the headland um, and where the final landform will be in terms of uh, the finished landform, which is, is yet to pan out as a debate, yeah. the site has got planning permission for taking hazardous waste and it's got waste management licenses that seek to regulate the acceptance of that waste. Okay, it's um, it's it's interesting. It's not taking me anywhere where I particularly need to to, to go um, okay, in, in terms of this planning considering. Um, okay, well, let me just um, take stock of where where we are. We need to take a short break uh, soon. Um, the question that, that that's hanging, of course, is uh, well, where where does where does it all go? Is is it going to be La Colette and that may be the case in, if uh, uh, certain planning applications are made and certain planning decisions uh, are, are made by the planning committee. Um, but um, 
I need to understand the, well, if they're not, how does this development, if the minister wishes to permit it, how does it manage these waste horizons? Where else would they go? And there are two particular areas I want to explore. One is the consented quarry site, uh, and the other is this notion of export and whether that is feasible. So those are the, the two areas I'd, I'd like to run through. I'm conscious of Mr Slater's time constraints. We'll, we'll take a... Let's take 10 minutes. And there's a planning permission that was granted in 2016. And it's got a 10-year implementation period. Um, who's... Oh, Mr Jones, are you familiar with this? <laughs> there's no need to rush. <laughs> So the, the quarry site, um, I was just uh, talking about planning permission that was granted in 2016. Um, I know the site, I've, I've, well, I've been there. Um, what, what can you tell me about that permission? Um, just get the application on the, my screen. So, yeah, hang on. Right. Um, that application was uh, approved for uh, an inert waste recycling facility for the production of um, secondary aggregate and soils and the restoration of the western part of the site to agriculture and woodland. Um, as you say, that was approved in 2016 and has a 10-year permission expiring on the 27th of September 2016. So um, that's an existing uh, quarry in production for granite products. Um, it's a private site. Um, I haven't been party to any recent discussions that the government might be having with the owners of um, granite products to um, uh, undertake that permit for inert waste before uh, 26, sorry, 2026 sorry, is the expiry date. I haven't been party to any discussions, um, but I think the crucial element of all this is that the, the site is uh, proposed to take um, inert waste and um, there's no inference that it will uh, be taking hazardous or contaminated waste so assuming that I sorry I'm just to... thinking a quick question hasn't granite products site has got planning permission for landfill inert waste only inert waste only yes. yeah yeah <laughs> So, uh, I suppose a couple of questions that, that fall out of that. Um, the first one is assu assuming the, uh, the, the filling is, is brought on stream and there's, there's obviously value in such a planning permission and uh, uh, no reason to doubt that it, it wouldn't be implemented in, in the fullness of time. Um, of the 113 thousand cubic meters that we mentioned what proportion could potentially go to such a facility is my first question okay so that go takes us back perhaps to a discussion i had with mr ruddleston earlier um so in my proof initial proof of evidence we considered there to be 72,000 cube of that 113,000 could be inert. So this is back to the table. In my proof of evidence. Ah, your proof of evidence yeah. table. Yeah. Right. So that's from based on the opinion of our specialist contractor and is subject to you know, trials that would be carried out and further investigations. 
So my discussions with Mr Ruddleston when we came up with our statement of common ground, Mr Ruddleston had a different view that whilst that might be the case, it might not. I, I, basically, in, in my opinion, I didn't think there was enough information to be able to put, put a figure on it. At the moment? Yeah. But there might be, you know, when we get more information, then we might prove that it's... And that definitely would be, that definitely would be one of the focuses of focuses of, of, of the further work would be to classify the waste. There's been very little waste classification done to date. Okay. Well, let, let's, uh, for argument's sake, say it, it is the figure for all. And, you know, it's a decent, decent chunk of the 113, isn't it? Um, well, I suppose the second question just, just uh, is around the broader sustainability as to whether it is particularly sustainable to dig up 72,000 cubic metres of landfill waste. I guess a fair bit of it would have arisen um, in St Helier in the town itself and tr uh, chucking it all the way up St Peter's Valley and all those round trips. Discuss. That's something that I guess I can't answer in terms of yeah, my, my role is to advise on the technical issues surrounding that question, whereas I think what you're asking probably goes back to an earlier question in the inquiry about actually, well, why are there basements on the scheme? Why are we generating this amount of material in the first place? Which is not a question that I can answer, but I would hand over to Mr yeah. Nicholson, who can probably answer that much better than I can. Okay. So, if I may, um, and I'll possibly I'll hand, hand over to Mr. Conn. Um, this 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 does bring us back to the ambitions of the scheme in terms of placemaking, um, in terms of activating the the, the ground plane connectivity, um, and and linking in um, and and seamlessly linking in with the um, with with the existing. Um, surrounding um, properties and, and streets. When we look at the basement, and Mr. Conn may have some statistics on this, the basement is fulfilling a, a number of um, key functions for the development. It is where the um, cycle storage, it's where the private storage facilities for the residential units that's a requirement um, coming in is provided along with the car parking. There's M&E facilities, there, is, there, are, there are refuse stores. If, if those activities were to be, um, even if we had a scenario where we had zero um, car provision, the, the ground floor with just the other activities would be sterilized um, by the, uh, all of those um, uh, referenced um, uses. So the, the basement is, is a, is a, a necessary uh, facility um, to, to, to deliver this, um, uh, this, this development that's very much focused, as I say, on placemaking. But Mr Conn, would you like to yeah, add on? Yeah, no, I can pick up on that to an extent as well. In terms of what's actually included within the basement, um, some kind of high-level, well, fairly, fairly approximate figures, but it's around 25% parking bays uh, it also includes 25 percent of uh of the space being used for plant residential cycle parking the cycle hub um bin storage and various other uses and then the remaining being the circulation and cores etc which obviously to some extent is associated with parking i understand the point um, you make mr con and um mr henry um that does respond to the planning authorities proof of evidence where they are questioning, do you need that amount of basement or couldn't you have less? Mm. It, though, doesn't <coughs> answer that issue I've been exploring you know, this afternoon around, if I fully accept everything you say on, on, on that, if I, if I come to the, the view that, yes, you, you make a jolly good case and uh, you've still got 113,000 cubic metres of stuff to get rid of somewhere uh, and that's what I, I, I just need to explore which is why I was asking about the uh, the quarry and I'm going to ask about, about export 
Um, and it clearly is, as, as you've presented it, it's a fundamental part of the scheme. And I can understand those arguments um, that if you don't, well, you know, if you don't have the parking in the basements, and you, you end up with a very different scheme, don't you? You don't have that sort of car-free, uh, uh, high-quality public realm that you've uh, you, you've explained to, to me. So I get all that, but I still need to give the minister some advice on that you know, quite significant amount of waste arisings. So I, th I think in answer. To your question, sir, about where the materials will go. So obviously we've you've rightly identified that one option is Lacolette, but there's a lot of uncertainty around that at the moment. Yep. That hopefully will crystallise in terms of the benefit of this development and also the island itself. Um, then there's the quarry we've talked about where some materials could go. That's the second option. And then the third option, which is perhaps the last resort, the least preferred option, is to export material. And we discussed this with Mr Monks in terms of that. We export for recovery only. So you can't export fragments of asbestos, for example, to the UK. There's an agreement in place that says you can't do that. Um, but you can export soils for recovery to the UK, but you do need to have um, sort of followed through on all the possible on-island options first, and then you would need to get permission from the states of Jersey, the government, in order to do that. Um, but that is a, a possibility, but it has to be for recovery. Okay. I think what I was really just think was in was it your proof, Mr. Monks, that yeah. export is not really a feasible option. That's what I was picking up. Um, well, or that's what I was trying to set out in the proof failed. that there's a distinction between export for disposal and export for recovery. Export for recovery generally can happen. Yeah. Jersey exports lots of waste for recovery. It, it exports incinerated bottom ash for recovery. It incinerates lead-acid car batteries to a lead smelter in Derbyshire for recovery. So if things are exported for recovery, it can generally happen. It needs the permission of the government of Jersey and the competent authority in England or Belgium or wherever this waste is sent for recovery. So that can happen. But when waste is sent for disposal, Jersey has to prove to the jurisdiction that it intends to send waste for disposal. This is why in my proof I talk about having gone round the houses a bit in 2015, where Jersey's government was seeking to export asbestos instead of dealing with it in Jersey. And um, so if we want to export waste for disposal, we have to prove that we can't deal with it in Jersey and seek through a, a mechanism called the duly reasoned request, which happens every three years where we negotiate as Jersey which wastes Jersey can't deal with and need to be disposed of in the UK. Okay. So, sorry, it's getting a bit complex. Yeah. It's all in my proof, but Carl's absolutely right. You know, le legally and theoretically, we can expect, export waste uh, soils as, as long as it's going for a recovery operation. Now, whether there's sites that exist in the UK, you know, that would be down to the developer to explore that with. Uh, but legally, it's theoretically possible to export waste from Jersey to recovery operations. For disposal operations, that's a lot more problematic. There's a higher bar to jump through. We have to prove that we can't do it here. And that's why with asbestos, back in 2015, the UK government said, uh, no, the, the, the Jersey can landfill its own asbestos. It's got the technology. Landfill is the tried and tested way of getting rid of asbestos. So you can't send it to England to do it here. OK, so of, of that big figure that we talked about, the 113,000, um, if the cases were, were, were made and the legal consents were, were issued, 
Is it that 72,000 figure that is potentially exportable? Or is it the full figure? So I, I would say, so I mean, we've, we have through um, Kelpray again, have explored the options for the material, the 113,000 cubic metres with um, some UK operators. So just getting an in principle, it's not a quotation or something like that, but an in principle idea that could we send this material for recovery to the UK based on the information that we have at the moment? And the answer was, yes, you could. And, you know, as per the discussions for the types of activities we've already talked about earlier that we might do on our site, those activities could easily under, be undertaken on a site in the UK. Um, they may go as far as to undertake things like soil washing, where you wash the soil, you generate the harder material, you generate other materials, you may be left with a very small amount of highly concentrated contaminated material, but we consider that that would be a very small byproduct of a recovery activity and not a disposal activity per se. So I think there's a strong case to say that yes, you could export for recovery. Now that would need to be explored. You, you mean you could export for recovery the, yeah. the whole amount in theory? In theory. No, but, that, <coughs> but the, the whole point is, is it's unknown whether, whether the soil could be recovered. Because currently we don't know if, if asbestos is your barrier to recovery. We don't know how much soil is going to contain asbestos. So I think with so for, with asbestos, for example, if there are visible fragments of asbestos, then we would need to hand pick those on the island, and we wouldn't be sending those to the UK. But we we would if you have small amounts of fibres in the material that to me, wouldn't preclude it for recovery. Mm. Okay. I'm not entirely sure about that. I think in our common ground statement, um, we were speaking about asbestos from the development. In our experience, we haven't ever been able to export asbestos from the island, whether it's solid lumps or, you know, we've never, we've never asked the question in terms of contaminated soils with fibrous asbestos. But I'm assuming that the UK's position would be no, you can landfill contaminated materials with asbestos in Jersey, you can't export them. So the recovery option, the export for recovery option, I don't think that can apply to soils contaminated with asbestos fibres. That's what I've, I've said, we've said in that common ground statement. Um, um, but again, you know, without assessing the quality of the waste and the quantity of asbestos fibres and whatever the permit of the site that's the recovery site that might it might be exported to, it might be a possibility, I suppose. I think, yeah, in our statement of common ground, we specifically looked at the management of asbestos containing materials and yeah. we included in... This is the statement of common ground um, between my myself and Mr Monks, as uh, section 2.4 on page 2. So this was, this particular aspect of it was looking at either disposing of it at La Colette, so asbestos containing materials, um, which is obviously subject to capacity and planning permit status. Yeah. or potentially retaining asbestos materials on site. Um, we didn't really discuss it in terms of sending it off island for recovery, per se. Um, no, I think I, I was assuming that it couldn't happen, which is why in that 2.4 we've got, you know, these asbestos-contained materials need to be managed on Jersey as they cannot be exported from Jersey for a waste disposal activity. Um, I suppose in the earlier section of that, we said pieces of asbestos containing materials identified in excavated soils will be, be handpicked, hand um, and soils containing asbestos will be managed in accordance with an asbestos management plan. I, it, it gets a bit complicated, doesn't it? If there was a few fibres in the soil, you might not have picked that up. 
in your testing, or you might have found trace levels of asbestos in the soil, I don't see that as precluding export for recovery. If there were lots of fragments of visible asbestos in the soil, then I agree that would, that, that yeah. would definitely have to be handpicked. And then that material would either go to land, the, the asbestos. If you imagine, so if you have a, you know, some soil spread out on the ground in front of you, mm -hmm. there could be fragments, you know, the size of your hand or the size of a, a coin or something like that that you can see of asbestos containing materials or even a bag of asbestos or even lagging that's fibrous asbestos. You could remove that under controlled conditions and then you'd be left with some residual soil that may have some metal contamination in it or hydrocarbon contamination in it. It may also have, and very likely to have, trace levels, very, very small amounts of fibres that you can't see with the visible, you know, with your eye. That material that's left, I would say you could export for recovery, whereas the materials you've handpicked out, you can't. <coughs> I, I, I'm inclined to agree with that, but I don't think we've addressed in the in the in the common ground statement export of soils contaminated with asbestos fibres for recovery. I, I, I'd be concerned about sort of going that far in terms of my opinion, because it all depends on the how you classify the soil and what the receiving sites that that might be capable of dealing with the soils is prepared to accept. Yeah, I mean we agree with that. And I think there are sites, you know, in the UK where that is possible. Right. That they, they are allowed to do that. Um, but obviously we would have to, we'd, we'd be we'd have to the verify that first we'd before be we testing the water it. a bit if we were seeking to export soils with asbestos fibres in. Uh, I mean, it's, I'm just explaining the history of us not being able to export asbestos previously for any disposal activities, obviously. So it's kind of new ground, testing it in terms of soils export contaminated with asbestos fibres for a recovery operation. That's a new... Um, well, I think if you look in, you know, as Mr. Ruddleston said earlier, that asbestos testing has changed and come on significantly in, in the recent times. So you could have soils in the past that were tested that didn't have asbestos, and then you apply a modern test to them, and they have. It's the same soil, nothing's changed. Mm. It's got more sort of sensitive in its analysis. So, you know, I see it that lots of soil, all soils probably that go for recovery in the UK probably have traces of asbestos in. You know, that's just normal. Most soil that you dig up will have fibres of asbestos in it. Okay. So, um that, that makes sense. The only other thing to add, of course, it's in there, is about that it's, it's, it's not Jersey's government's decision in, entirely on its own. It's the Environment Agency is the competent authority if the site's in England to agree to the export. But theoretically, if it's export for recovery and the site in the UK will have a permit issued by the agency that will say whether it's recovery or disposal activities, and if it's recovery activities, then theoretically that export will be possible. Okay. Probably be just costly. Let, let me ask, be um, just ask on the export option, assuming it were to be uh, legally feasible and permitted by the receiving country. Is that an expensive option? It sounds it. Um, so we have again looked into this. We. Um, obtained indicative prices when from the operators that we were talking to about the principles of this and we provided that information this was via Kelpray again they talked to people about this and how it might work and we provided um, prices for this to the applicant so I think Mr Henry is able to answer your question on that I, sir. I don't need no figures but just just to in terms of words is it a an absorbable developable de development cost? It is, yes, sir. It, it is an increase from the current um, rates were we able to dispose at La Colette. Um, so the, the current La Colette disposal rate, I believe, is £66 per tonne. 
um, and it, we've been provided via our consultants with a quote of, a, of £100 a tonne. So. That's clear. One hundred and thirteen, yeah, one one three. One one three. Can I just ask on this on the export in regards to the UK and I understand you say Thank you. Um I find it fascinating. Um but when the UK government says, look, we don't want your uh mixed asbestos uh soil uh because you can dump it on your land, um but it's already dumped on our land, so they must also have an opinion. We don't like the idea of digging up uh, a landfill site with asbestos and shipping it and dumping it in the UK. So it's not a situation where you've got somewhere to put it. It's already on a landfill site today. The question you're asking, can we dig up an existing landfill site with hazardous waste and export it to the UK? Uh, is that fair? Do you want to I'm not that? sure what the question is. Well, I think the question you asked was, can you dig up an existing landfill? Well, well, yeah. so when you spoke to the environmental agency in the UK and so said, we want to export uh, to, uh, hazardous uh, soil with asbestos in it, they say, no, you, you shouldn't. You should dump it on your own land. I take the truck and dump it somewhere in Jersey. Hmm. That's what they're saying. When we ask the question well, of... Let me, let me what I'm then saying, why didn't you say to them, no, what we are asking you is we want, we've already dumped it in Jersey and we want to dig it up and put it on a truck and take it to England to dump it. Because that's a very different question. That's all I'm I, and, and I could not quite understand why. If the environmental what? agency have already stated that we don't want to accept you you know, collecting this waste and delivering it to us when you can dump it somewhere in Jersey. Yeah. Mr McCarthy, it might help, but my, my understanding of what I was hearing was that the, the notion of digging up landfill and putting it on a truck and a boat and taking it over to uh, England or wherever and landfilling it again is, is not something we're talking about. We're no. talking about um, that, that, would, that just would not be permitted, uh, it, it, would, it would get a, a, a no. Uh, but what Mr Slater was explaining was about uh, digging it up, doing some sort in removal of chunks of asbestos or whatever, and in his view, uh, the, uh, that material could then be exported for recovery. So by recovery, it gets soil washed or treated or whatever and uh, turned into a product. Is that that's correct, sir, yeah. So it's brought back into beneficial use rather than just put in a landfill in the, right. in the UK. Yeah. And, I mean, just, it's not a case of just you know, going on site and sending a load of people to pick up some bits of old asbestos. This is your processing, aren't you, on site? This goes back to the wording. So you will have to have a, uh, uh, um, a, a license process hazardous waste on the site and to do that you first of all need planning and then you have to consult within at least 100 meters from the activity which includes obviously all the lawyers <laughs> along with the Esplanade um, uh, and consult with them because they're all downwind so I go beyond 100 meters um, that they need to understand that if you did this work you cannot guarantee that they will not be exposed to any asbestos fibres from your activity, because it's a physical impossibility, knowing that this site is at level of exposure to the high winds. Mr. Vibert. Yeah. Actually, I want some guidance, actually, as to whether this is the right question, because uh, we may be coming to it. I want to ask the developer whether 
or what steps they'll be taking to protect the people who live on the waterfront during this process? Because it seems to me to be a pretty dangerous process uh, and it concerns a lot of people who live down there. But it may come under another session. I think that's tomorrow morning session on construction de and demolition impacts. Ms. Mr. Young. to Mr Monk's advice, I think I would be personally cautious about assuming that Jersey would wish to apply to export material in the way that's been described. I th I'd like to, you know, if Mr Monk was able to just elaborate on that, because reputational issues matter. You know, Jersey is a rich community and seems to be a rich community, and I think the view would come that we should be capable of looking after our waste management ourselves. Uh, I don't think it's just a matter of technicality and so on. That's, that's my thought. I welcome Mr Monks's, if he's able to agree with me or uh, elaborate on that. I've given a view of the legality of whether things are possible. Um, I haven't really commented on the political uh, desirability or otherwise of, of any proposed course of action. That, that's where my statement stops. Um, you know, it, it's, it's legally possible to export waste for recovery. You need the permission of both the receiving and the jurisdiction that's sending the waste. If you send waste for disposal, there's a higher barrier, and we've tested it with asbestos to get rid of it out of the island previously and to, to, to the UK government, and we've been told no, because Jersey's got the, got the technology to deal with that asbestos on the island. So, there was sorry. one final question. I'm sorry, I should have got this in. Up to now, all the discussion so far is about the 113,000 uh, tonnes of material. Uh, we, we've heard that the, if the scheme is approved, um, that, that risings won't occur until beginning 2025, I think it was said. Could we know what the annual rate of risings from all other sites in the island are? Because obviously we are appear to be trying to slot in or form a, an informed view about whether or not what limited waste um, handling facilities we've got now will cope. So it seems to me that one should at least consider what arisings come from other sources, bearing in mind the amount of building work going on in the island. Is, I wonder if that information is available. If it is, I apologise if it's in the paperwork. Uh, I'm not entirely sure Mr. Riv might have a comment, but you know, predicting the future is notoriously difficult. Sometimes you can do it by looking at what you know waste has already been received in the past. Uh, yeah, this is where I get out, I get out my crystal ball. Um, <laughs> it, as as Mr. Marks has said, this is notoriously difficult. Uh, we monitor and watch all planning applications going through, and we pick up on those that either declare um, known contaminations or the potential for contaminations, and we evaluate the um, the waste arisings likely to occur. Um, the issue with that, and a, a prime example with this application, is that at the outline design stage, typically there is not the clarity on the known amounts of contamination because the testing hasn't or isn't available to be undertaken due to existing buildings. Um, we do currently know of a number of different sites that have already told us about um, the potential for contaminated waste. Unfortunately, I don't have the figures with me, but we, I think we can provide those after. Um, that we know we'll have a call on La Colette if the call it becomes available, um, and, and that is both public and private projects um, that require waste disposal. Uh, but all of those projects, as per this project, are also looking to mitigate their waste, um, reviewing minimisation, treatment, and reuse within their own envelope, their development. It, Mr. Reeve, it would actually be useful to see that list just so I can contextualise it in, in my report. Yep. So. If you could send that to the programme officer, that would be very helpful. Also, I meant to ask earlier, Mr Jones, the photo that you displayed of La Colette, could, could we have that as well to the programme officer? Yes, we'll, we'll add that to the inquiry documents list. 
Okay. Uh, sorry, I was just going to make one last comment, if possible, yes, on course, exporting uh, the shipment of waste. Uh, as far as I can recall, that hasn't been assessed in the EIA, uh, and we'd need to rescope that in terms of the transporting of it. So that, that hasn't been considered. No, the EIA assumes that it goes to La Colette, doesn't it? But... I mean, I, I guess uh, I have to say, uh, at the time it was done, that was a fair assumption to make. Yes. <laughs> yes. We did make reference to the possibility of export in the EIS in terms of ground conditions and excavation waste as a sort of a fallback position. And I think you, you're right, yes. Yeah. I think there was a, uh, a fleeting reference. So, sorry, sir, if I may, just a very final um, observation, just responding to um, uh, the first point from Mr. Young that I know Mr. Monks um, provided a, a comprehensive uh, reply, just to, just to really add to that. From, from and, and not uh, obviously uh, uh, swaying into the uh, political arena, um, but from, from the optics of a wealthy community um, looking to export um, waste, uh, I think we do, we, we've referenced this point, but it, it is purely for recovery. Um, and I think the, uh, the, the, the sort of international arena would accept that small jurisdictions just, just won't have the capacity and the throughput um, of those waste streams to to, to warrant um, a, a treatment centre uh, to be provided locally, and therefore that, that opportunity with uh, agreement from neighbours um, can, can, can come into play. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr McCarthy. I will be brief, I promise. Um, I do pick up what John's saying. I see it even going further, that a quarter of the basement is for bins. Jersey people generate it's one of the correct. highest amount of waste per person than in, the, uh, the, in Europe. However, Guernsey are one of the best, the least amount of waste. So, but then I, I, I want to also highlight that the um, development framework, which was done, uh, what are we talking about, four years ago, five years ago, um, did not provide a strategic environmental impact assessment. If it had, if it had, we would have covered all of this then. And we would not be doing it now. So we're going to try and assess a planning application against, an environment, uh, against um, a development framework about waste that doesn't exist. So I think this is just another example of somebody trying to put their underpants on after they put their trousers on. You should, everything is a sequence of events, and I think we should learn from this as we go forward. Thank you. Can I just clarify, it was 25% was all other uses besides parking and, and circulation, so that was bins, it bikes. It's like a large area for bins. Et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. a, a point made, uh, noted. Okay. I think I've covered all of the items I wanted to here. It's quite a useful session for me, uh, but um, I th think you can um, well imagine that uh, it's it's one I'm going to have to scratch my head over in terms of what what I've put in the report to the minister. But just just perhaps to draw us to a close. Um, I would actually be interested to hear from the applicant and the planning authority what you think I should say yeah. to, to the Minister. I've got a very brief uh, series. I've got, I've got four points, sir, really. Um, I think we, we, we started to link some of the uh, individual technical disciplines together and look at the uh, application as a whole. We feel very strongly the basement is justified in a design sense in relation to uh, placemaking, in relation to the objectives of the uh, design section of the Bridging Island Plan, 
and in relation to the expectations in the Southwest and Elliot framework. Uh, that work has been done, it, it has been submitted to a lot of engagement with the Architecture Commission, and I can ask, uh, you referred to section 6.2 of the DAS for a, a summary of that. So that's the, the, the first point. The second point is that we've taken this matter very seriously. It, is, um, it has been explored, pushed, pulled, and um, all that has been to try and align the application with the uh, waste hierarchy, um, acknowledging the, the context that, that we have. So we have explored um, all the options for really getting the basement extent to an absolute minimum. Uh, the vertical heights have been reconsidered, the depths have been reconsidered um, in the context of its practical use, in the context of the uh, amount of planting, etc., that, that's going into it. Um, we have also um, had a, a lot of early engagement, as, as you've heard from the uh, Waterman's team, through um, pre-contract discussions with, with Kelpray to, 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 to get intelligence into this uh, uh, equation uh, and uh, understand how uh, options may emerge from that. We have had very good engagement with the uh, government team who uh, I think uh, acknowledge that, um, this is my third point, we are not unique in relation to the challenges uh, that the island has in relation to waste. Um, there is an emerging issue, particularly I think it's fair to say with, with inert waste um, in uh, relation to the island uh, as a whole and the approach that the government uh, may want to take. The, the team here are from uh, regulation side and from uh, the operational side, but strategically government has to make some choices about how government wants a way to deal with and that is not uh, within our gift and it is not unique to us. So there are a whole series of other sites which we've, we've heard about which are uh, going to be in the same uh, situation and there will need to be some priorities uh, identified uh, politically. That's my third point, we're, we're not unique. Fourth point is, I think we uh, are in a position where, from our perspective, there, is, uh, there needs to be a robust site waste management plan, pulling all these things together, uh, discussing options uh, in, in relation to the, the actions that, that uh, need to come next, uh, the additional sampling, the um, phased uh, approach to these matters through the subsequent reserve matters applications, etc. Uh, but most fundamentally, uh, I think there needs to be a position reached where there are some uh, some triggers discussed, uh, whereby, um, for example, it might be the case that um, excavation doesn't commence until permission is in place at La Colette or some other agreed government position has become clarified. Um, I think the last six months have um, turned that on its head and we all need clarification. Uh, the fallback is that um, there is a, um, a, a situation where if uh, scenario A in relation to like that or other sites doesn't emerge, then um, export um, may need to be agreed and a process needs to be, go to, uh, needs to be gone through to uh, get uh, that concluded as well. So. Uh, it, it is not a, a, a kind of open-ended uh, issue. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, things to be done still. Uh, the majority of those are outside the gift of the uh, applicant and the um, regulator, and sort of wider government, but most fundamentally something along the, side, uh, along the lines of a, a Grampian approach following the conclusion of an appropriate safe waste, uh, site waste management plan, um, excavation, uh, needs to be undertaken in, in, in a manner um, which follows on from confirmation of capacity at La Colette or the agreement of export. Thank you, Mr Nicholson. That is clear. And I could go to the planning authority and lay down the same challenge to them. Um, you've... Um, what we've heard from uh, the, the, the waste regulatory experts, um, I don't know... Mr. 
Jones or Mr. Johnson, if you want to pick this up, it is in the planning proof. You've raised it as a big issue. Uh, you don't quite get to the point of telling me what to do about it. So, um, I think, as I alluded to in the presentation on the planning history, there are a number of unknowns. Um, complicated issue, as you know. Um, I know that um, La Colette is a finite resource, and at some stage, it will run out of space for both inert and contaminated hazardous waste, and that the government have um, a need to try and find alternative locations for this um, for this element. Um, we mentioned the uh, quarry at St Peter's Valley, um, which has uh, a permission in place up until 2026 for the provision of inert material, um, not contaminated or hazardous material. I don't know what discussions are taking place at a higher level than myself to try and resolve the issue of, um, of hazardous and contaminated material. Um, the second application at La Colette, um, one of the criteria that the applicant will have to provide the committee with is a full justification of the waste hierarchy. So La Colette is at the bottom of the waste hierarchy and they will have to provide the committee with more assessment of the requirements to reuse, reduce, uh, recycle, etc. And it may well be that work may be uh, helpful to us and the committee in that respect. Um, we've heard about the application and the, the need for the applicants to provide a basement. Um, that is their own wish to provide this basement. Um, that hasn't been asked for by ourselves as far as I know. So technically it's, it's, it's been bought upon by part of the application proposal. So um, we've also got other applications that have been alluded to, Elizabeth Terminal, um, JDC's application at South Hill, for example, which are going to be generating uh, elements of waste. Um, so we've got a lot of considerations to take in respect of other proposals on the island. And we'll come on to the issue of conditions tomorrow, but uh, I won't touch on it in great detail now, but we're not entirely sure how you're going to handle this in terms of, of condition. It's all very well saying we'll, we'll fix it at a later date, but contamination uh, disposal is an essential element of the scheme with a lot of unknowns, a great deal of unknowns, and our first thoughts are we're not entirely sure how that's going to be adequately controlled, even by something like a, a Grambian condition. You know, it's, it's something to discuss in more detail tomorrow. Okay, we, I, we certainly yeah, will. I think there are concerns about that as well. If I might just come to supplement my, my position earlier, we, we've got a strategy of the island plan that seeks to uh, focus new development in, in the built-up areas. That uh, the, the challenge of waste uh, is is a theme that runs through the entire strategy of the plan. Then, even though uh, some buildings uh, may be may be retrofitted, there, there is a huge amount of stock in in Jersey. Um, which is not suitable for uh, retrofitting. Um, there is a uh, whole raft of uh, what, what might be considered um, uh, as uh, community infrastructure matters, which also need uh, a, a resolution to this waste issue. Uh, we've got a, a programme of affordable housing. We've just um, the, the, the most recent approval for, for that site, uh, for affordable housing, is the Ancourt site, uh, and there is a, a not inconsiderable amount of waste to be generated through that, even though some of the site is clear already. Um, the, these these high-level objectives of government, such as delivering a new hospital, will all involve the generation of waste, 
uh, and whether it's inert or um, uh, hazardous, contaminated, or whatever EU terminology anyone wants to refer to, uh, government will need to provide a solution um, or we will be nowhere near uh, delivering any of the objectives of the island plan. I think government has demonstrated its commitment. There is uh, some, uh, there's been some very prompt responses at ministerial level following the um, context of the um, committee uh, resolutions earlier this year. There seems to be a pathway which committee have indicated uh, they would be uh, open to reviewing. Of course, there is a, a statutory uh, process to, to, to be gone through, but it appears to me that government is not standing still on this matter. They know that the uh, situation at La Colette is, is fast becoming a, uh, a, a rather sticky situation. And it appears to me that um, there are a number of options outside this room uh, which may come forward. Thank you, Mr Nicholson. So were you indicating again, Mr Bugatti? I'd just love to help you, but you speak to the Yeah, you need the mic. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I think it was a very useful day. Very good. Um, thank you for sharing it. It's, uh, I remember that it was 50% uh, of the islanders don't have cars. And 30% of the islanders live in St Helier. And I would say the majority of that, those cars... Found, uh, households don't own a car are in St Helier. So if we translate that to like extending St Helier to the site, I think that, that we could assume that a lot of people are very happy in St Helier not needing a car park space beneath their feet in, in the basement. The other thing that came up was the fire and electric vehicles. Uh, uh, that is a, is a major question that can, you, can we go forward? This is a future-proof scheme. Um, and uh, whether we can have electric vehicles in the basement anyway. Um, but the other thing is, uh, I think we can deliver uh, all the housing, we, you know, a thousand homes, without a basement. I don't think that's, I don't think we can say, the normal densities, we get four storeys, you put a concrete raft over a contaminated site, lock it in, and then you, you can build uh, houses above that four stories and they all can be daylit and all those great things. So the other bit is is demolition and loss of the children's play uh, area of the, the swimming pool and the cinema. And if it would be useful because obviously to dig, to demolish it, which is only, it's only um, 20 years old, so a third of its design life is, is young, um, much younger than me. And uh, then if you then demolish it and you excavate it, you're going to have to pay money to export that waste, um, which that money could be spent on affordable housing. So I do ask, it's, it is complex. And my last request is, and I didn't think of, the, when you move into waste, please don't ask a planning committee to be able to judge, make, a, you know, make an informed decision on the complexities of hazardous waste. It's not possible. As we just explained now, we've got learned professionals here which don't even agree on the definition. So I, I plead that um, we need to, we should have sorted it out when the framework was done. We need to sort it out now before we can go forward. But please don't leave it as an issue where we kick the can down the road and we'll sort it out later. Because the people who are going to suffer from that is us, is the public. Because it generates uncertainty and fear and we won't need that. The other thing is, because uh, it will get into the press, it will be so detrimental to the tourism industry if they think, if you go to a Jersey, you're, go you're going on to a beach that's contaminated, because they won't come. And so I think all these issues we need to take into consideration on behalf of the public. Thank you. Thanks, Mr McCarthy. Any closing remarks? Uh, Mr. Mr Young, for... Uh, uh, Mr. Vibert's got the mic, so if, if, if you... Okay. Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the developer put forward a fallback position and a number of options. I think he left an important option out, which is how to deal with the mountain of hazardous waste that exists. 
And surely one way of doing that is not dig it out and not have basements in the flats and or limit it just to the car park so you're limiting the amount that's coming out. And I think when you consider most of the flats and tower blocks in Jersey don't have underground parking, uh, don't have basements and everybody lives very happily. Now I know there's a criteria to want to make this uh, cars off the roads and that's a very laudable thing. However, this is a very real problem and there's a very good chance of you having to put so many conditions on to overcome the problem that it's going to be very difficult for the whole proceedings to take place. So I think there's a compromise and the compromise should be looking at whether you really need to be digging it out at all. Okay, Mr Young, I think you're the last one. Thanks, sir. I think that was a, a very uh, useful and informative discussion. I think where it takes me to in my, you know, where, where do we take this from now is that um, it will take us, I think, into the issue of uh, implementation and, in, and if this scheme is approved because increasingly we seem to be in the arena where we have here a planning application and proposal which is so dependent on so many downstream issues. And yesterday we spoke about traffic, um, and, we, and I think I'm certainly clear there are downstream issues on that. Even if we don't respond uh, to the points and discussion being made yesterday about the in infrastructure issue and managing the road, sure as inevitability it's going to be is that traffic will increase and come to a point where we get gridlock in town, so something will have to be done. Here we've got another area, which is how to dispose of waste, which we've kicked into the long grass for the best part of three decades. And so here, you know, so is it, well, I ask, you know, where, where that leads to is, a, is it right that we make our planning decisions on the basis of unknowns and assumptions and rely on conditions and, and assurances that all is well because we've got actions there, we're going to do those things. And yet our track record in Jersey has been poor in that respect. We have convinced ourselves, you know, when we had problems, we convinced ourselves there's ways around it, we can go with it. Is it right that we do so? We've probably already got loads of consent out there anyway, which will result in waste to rising. Here we've got another. Um, yes, I feel if the alternatives were there, the, the, the quarry in St Peter's Valley, yes, absolutely, sir, there's a question of sustainability of moving, um, moving material up and down that road, which I, I'm not keen on. But there is a consent in place, but of course, my last uh, understanding of that, that's not going anywhere, uh, because of course the state's blocked the aspirations of the owner of that company who made it quite plain that in order to continue operations in that site, they need to have the land zone uh, for uh, increasing their activity, which the states uh, refused to do in the island plan. Another example where our political processes, I'm afraid, kicked the issues uh, down the road. So the questions for you and the minister is, is it right that we make planning decisions that uh, prove things that rely on future and unknown, and whether or not we can be confident about that with the tools we've got. I think we can be, we're going to have that discussion tomorrow. I think we can be more confident about planning obligation agreements because I feel confident that those, you know, without those being agreed, there is no consent. Where with conditions, you give consent and then you rely on them, people doing things that they're supposed to do. Um, so I think that's the challenge for you, sir. I think myself, my past experience has been, would go against that. I think we've been doing that for far, far too long as an island. And I think at some time, we will have to live in the reality that within a small island, there's limited opportunities to do things. We have to live within our means. And that takes us to the heart of sustainability. Thanks, sir. So if I might just have a follow-up to that. We've got a development plan that requires us to deal with the development needs of the island. It requires us to do that in a balanced way and set some framework of considerations 
that need to be given weight in a planning assessment. Now, I feel very strongly about this. We, as a community, we have, to use a phrase that Mr Young used there, we have kicked the can in relation to waste issues. We haven't dealt with them. We need to. We have kicked the can in relation to Fort Regent, cinemas, sports facilities, swimming pools. We haven't dealt with them. We need to. We've kicked the can in relation to drainage, sustainable travel, the hospital, housing needs. We need to get some uh, progress on these things. I think Mr Nicholson makes my point. Well. Exactly. <laughs> OK. Well, right, OK. Well, that's been an interesting afternoon, a genuinely interesting afternoon. Um, OK, we'll, we'll draw to a close there. Um, for those returning tomorrow, it is, I'm glad to say, a lighter day. Um, we've got um, a session uh, to start the day on what's called other matters. It doesn't mean they're not important. And we will certainly be in that picking up demolition and construction impacts that was flagged earlier uh, in the day and I think earlier in the week. Uh, we'll also be looking at air quality and noise issues. And in that session 13, I will be doing a, uh, a sense check of, around uh, the room just to see if there's anything that anybody thinks I've missed in the course of the week or uh, they, they wish to uh, raise. That session, it's always difficult to estimate but it feels to me that it might be an, an hour maybe maybe a little bit more um, we've then got a session on conditions and planning obligations through the week I have been trying to uh, keep my notes up to date in terms of where conditions have been suggested um, I stress that that's all on a without prejudice basis uh, just so I can give the minister some advice on a, uh, a list uh, should he be minded to grant uh, permission similarly with planning obligations and then we will go into the final session uh, the summings up by the uh, main parties be useful at this stage uh, mr. Nicholson mr. Henry could you give me an indication of time on on that um, I don't think it will be um, a significant period of time I, I suggest 20 minutes half an hour Okay. As a, as a maximum, so yeah. And planning authority? Um, I think we could say probably 10 15 minutes. 10 15, okay. Right. Well, there's, there's a possibility we might we might conclude by the lunch break, but if we if we need to, to come back after that, that's, that's fine. Okay, well, thank you all for your contributions today, and uh, have, a, have a good evening. We finished at a civilised time this evening, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.